thank you all for being here. Um, this is a. I want to remind everybody. You're bringing your own chair, Senator? They told me to. Oh, Let's put it right there, Jeanette. It's fine. I, 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 no, it's all right. It, it doesn't. It's hard to get in there. Okay. Yeah. I am. Um, there was a water all over a chair, so I took the chair out, oh. and then I went to get another chair to replace it. Oh, well, that's very nice of you. Uh, you're also, as I understand it, the decider. I guess so. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't so, know that. It's like George Bush. Three people have called me the decider this morning. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. Um, yeah. I want must be a story there. Something. Must be a story. Uh, it's in Digger. I haven't seen it. Our attorney general is going to present the bill, but I want to remind people that this bill is about um, reporting on hate crimes and bias-motivated incidents. Do we have a bill? It is, it's, we, we have a rough draft. Oh. Bryn is, is going to hand that out after TJ uh, speaks a little bit about the bill um, and walk us through the bill. It's not, it hasn't been introduced yet, but um, you can wait. Okay, okay hand it up. Um, I just want to make clear this is not just Racial is any kind of hate incident. It includes LGBT community. It includes uh, anti-Semitic. It includes anything of that nature. So, I, while uh, a lot of us have been dealing with, particularly in the Bennington area, uh, racially motivated uh, incidents, this this covers hate crimes and hate speech, and they. Um, found an interesting, this is from H3, and I actually went and um, proposing an amendment to H3, and that's the uh, Ethics Studies Bill. Uh, um, the, according to the U.S. Department of Justice report on hate crimes in Vermont, in 2017, of 35 hate crimes reported, 51% were based on a motivation involving racial bias. 23% were based on a motivation involving sexual orientation bias. 17% were based on motivation involving religious bias. And 9% were based on a motivation involving disability bias. So let's just be clear that we're not talking about one form of hate crime or hate, hate, bias, hate bias incident. We're talking about all. And, um, in 2019, uh, we should all be more aware of this problem. So with that, I'd like to introduce the... Uh, yeah, uh, just, just two things. Uh, yeah, uh, the Attorney General, the, the, the Major was was walking in. We welcomed our, the Major. <coughs> Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me, TJ Dunham, Attorney General. Uh, Senator Sears, thank you for giving us the opportunity to introduce this bill, and thank you for uh, your opening remarks. And I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, hate is pervasive in this country. <coughs> and I think there's uh, historical legacy of hate in this country. Uh, but what I think we've seen in the last uh, couple years is that um, there is now license to openly hate. Uh, and perhaps that comes from uh, some folks down in Washington, D.C. who are in leadership who are giving people license to hate openly. Uh, perhaps it comes uh, with social media, uh, that it is more amplified now more than ever. And that this issue uh, is an issue that is a top priority for me, uh, for our office. Um, and I want to be clear before I, I start um, that this is an important first step that my office is committed to addressing the issues of hate. Uh, my office is committed to investigating uh, issues of hate. Uh, but there's not going to be a single solution to the issue of racism, to sexism, to homophobia, to anti-Semitism. Uh, there are limits to what the criminal justice and the civil system can do. We can't arrest or sue our way to a just or respectful society. We have work to do in our communities. 
we have work to do in our communities. Whether it's our schools, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, um, and this is, has to be part of the conversation as well. Uh, my civil rights director, Julio Thompson, is here uh, with me today. And Julio and I have gone around this state the last couple of years talking to high school students about uh, hate speech and civil discourse and the First Amendment. And I think both Julio and I are always so impressed with this next generation uh, of, of leaders that they don't seem, in my opinion, to be, to be as divided, uh, perhaps, as others by the issues of race or religion or gender. Uh, and that gives me real hope for the future. Um, so these are difficult issues. Uh, there are, these are hard truths. Uh, that have uh, plagued our country since its founding, frankly. And I want to thank this committee uh, for taking uh, the leadership on this issue and uh, taking this bill up. So thank you, Senator Sears. Well, so a few, a few weeks earlier, uh, we received a copy uh, of a letter that was sent to the committee from the Fair American Institute recommending legislation that would address hate crime and bias incident reporting and additional training. Uh, we support these ideas and look forward to working with you and others at a right, right and just right and right approach. You'll hear uh, details from others on this, but we certainly agree that we all need more information regarding the issues facing our community. Senator Sears, as you said, it's an issue is certainly about the issue of race, but it's also about anti-Semitism um, and uh, uh, attacks on our friends in the LGBTQ community as well. Our new bias incident reporting system is designed to address that need to open the channels of communication so that we all can respond in the appropriate manner. Whether that means criminal investigation and prosecution, referral to the Human Rights Commission for Civil Enforcement, or working with community stakeholders who plan to speak out against hate. And I would note last week um, in Burlington, uh, there was uh, hate speech uh, uh, left on a uh, synagogue as well as the Pride Center uh, in Burlington. And Rabbi Amy Small, who's a great leader uh, in speaking out against hate, and uh, the executive director of the Pride Center, uh, had a rally and a march down uh, Church Street, and then they spoke on the steps of Burlington City Hall, and I said to Rabbi Small, and you know, Julio and I have sent this message to so many others, but this is exactly what you do with hate speech. You meet hate speech with more speech about love, about solidarity, about inclusion, and about equality. And we think that uh, these bi our bias incident reporting system of bringing more people into this issue, sharing information, um, and coming up with uh, solutions and speaking out against hate uh, is part of the solution. At the same time, we want to ensure that we're collecting the most useful data in the most efficient way. Nearly all states in the District of Columbia have some form of hate crime laws, and many others have various reporting requirements. We'd like to learn from these examples on reporting to see what makes sense for us in Vermont. We've been speaking to other states about what they're doing. It's fair to say the subject has attracted the attention of most state agencies in the country on the issue of hate. This is a national issue. It's an issue in our state, but it's a national issue as well. We've also been in touch with subject matter experts from, from places like the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Center for Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State University regarding data collection. Julio Thompson can provide you more detail on these outreach efforts. At the same time, we want to ensure that we're collecting information in a way that does not chill free speech. Some bias incidents reported to law enforcement will fall in the area of protected speech. We want to be sure that we want to be sure that the enthusiasm for collecting information does not go too far and chill Vermonter from, from discussing matters of public import. We also believe that there should be more training for law enforcement. And that's not just police. That's dispatchers. That's prosecutors. That's everybody in this system. And I want to be clear about that. And I want to start with an anecdote on the issue of training of recognizing speech when I was Chittenden County State's Attorney, I got a call one night from a, from a friend who said that uh, two of his friends, who happened to be two women of color, 
had received flyers from the KKK at their homes. And he said that they called the police. And the dispatcher said, there's nothing we can do for you. And we started an investigation in that case, and we were able to bring a charge. Ultimately, we lost at the Vermont Supreme Court. But the important, is, the important is that we have to train everybody here into the system to spread information, to share information, and to look at it, whether it's a crime, whether it's a civil enforcement, or whether it is protected speech. And it can't stop and end at a dispatcher. It's got to go more. So we support increased training in areas of complaint intake, investigation, and reporting. Currently, our class teaches the hate crimes class at the Vermont, Vermont Police Academy. This April, our class will include the bias incident reporting system. We in the Vermont State Police have recognized the need to, for more advanced training for officers with field experience as well as dispatchers who receive calls. We have formed a collaboration with the Vermont State Police with Lieutenant Gary Scott and Major Ingrid Jonas and the Vermont Law School Immigration Law Clinic with Professor Aaron Jacobson to develop a roadshow training at Vermont State Police Barracks where local law enforcement will be invited to attend. We expect to launch that later this spring. We think it will be uh, as much a learning experience for us and hope we can use those lessons learned in future training. We understand and share the desire for additional training and resources for that training and look forward to working with others about best practices in this area. As I said earlier, there's not gonna be a single solution to these issues of hate and racism and sexism and homophobia. Uh, there are limits to what the criminal justice and civil court system can do. As I said, we cannot think that we can arrest or sue our way to a just and respectful society, that this work also resides in our communities in teaching the next generation about tolerance, about love, about inclusion and equality. And I do think that work is happening in our schools, in our neighborhoods. But in inclusion, better communication and reporting will help us get, to a, get a better sense of where we need to focus our efforts so we can use all the tools at our disposal to affirm our commitment to justice, fairness, and decency for all Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there questions for the Attorney General? DJ, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, I think this is a, an extremely important issue, and uh, um, I and the members of this committee take very seriously. And something that a lot of people seem to miss that you touched on there is a difference between criminal threatening and saying something as repulsive and as ignorant and as whatever words I can think of um, that is hurtful and hate motivated, but may not be to the level of criminal threatening. And, and you know, I've, I've actually seen examples in the recent trials and tribulations in my hometown of Bennington where you know some pretty hurtful things and said about other people that are not uh, of a protected class, but you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the dust up in Virginia reminded me of my days at UVM. Uh, I never came to my face at UVM, but I was there during the cakewalk era, and um, the I don't think anybody necessarily realized what, what it all meant and what we were doing, but we were celebrating a winter carnival weekend, and it was called Walking for the Cake. And your mother and I were talking about that the other day, because uh, when I got there in 1962, that was the big deal. And, you know, it was like the junior, senior prom and everything else all in together. And, after I left the university in, in, uh, in my sophomore year, because they didn't like my grades <laughs> for, for a brief period of time, uh, they, they just didn't like them. I don't understand why. But um, I went back and home and where I lived in, uh, just to the west of Boston. And I went to work in a warehouse that was operated by Zayers. None of you probably remember Zayers, but Zayers was the precursor to Kmart, Walmart, big stores, you know, you name them. And it was a warehouse that 
shift things centrally. And they didn't have enough employees. They couldn't get enough in that area. And so they would um, uh, provide buses for people who wanted to work and who came from the inner city. And that was my uh, being a suburban kid. I had been involved with a lot of Latinos because we had a fairly large population of uh, Latinos. But I had never met too many uh, people, uh, blacks. Um, and getting to work alongside those folks was an eye-opener to me. So here I had just come from Cakewalk to working side by side uh, and getting to know personally and, you know, any time you're working with somebody, you get to talk about their, you know, lives and what's going on. So you know, I, I developed some friendships there. And, and I took that back and I actually recognized but, you know, our innocence sometimes doesn't allow us to recognize what might be hurtful. And uh, the more we can do in schools, the more we can do through efforts like this to correct that behavior, the better off we all are. I appreciate the effort. And I want to mention, committee, any member who wants to sign on to the bill, because it hasn't been introduced yet, is welcome to sign on to it from this committee. Senator White. I also appreciate your saying that it isn't um, hate speech and non-civil discourse isn't just limited to, to racism or sexism. And when you were saying that, it reminded me of, I think it was probably in 2003, I don't know if you know the Putney School. Putney School is a very um, progressive liberal school. And I got a call from the headmaster who said, um, we have five or six kids here who are Republican, and they are feeling completely discounted yeah. by the other students. And it's gotten to the point where it was non-civil. And so they had me come up and they had me come up and talk to the, to the student assembly about civil discourse and how, so I mean, that was, it, it was a long time ago. And regular occurrence on this committee. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I was just reminded my comment about black. That was from 1963. Now, persons of color, and I misspoke. Um, I, 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 you know, as I said, Julio and I, um, I'm incredibly impressed with this next generation. And they don't. They do not seem to be as divided. Uh, frankly, as us, mm -hmm. and they seem to understand the issues of equality and inclusion and diversity uh, at a much deeper level uh, than our generation, and that gives me great hope. Uh, but we got to continue to do the, do the work uh, in the community to understand the scope of the problem. It, it is all the above, yeah. whether it's sexism, and, uh, homophobia, or anti-Semitism and racism, and we got to we got to keep training on it. Um, because this issue is not going away. It's, it's as I said, this <clears throat> it, it's been here. Uh, reading a great book, uh, These Truths, which is about uh, Jill Lepore, who writes about the history of our, our, our country and talks about the issue of racism as being kind of the original sin of, of, of this country. And um, I think what we have to do when we talk about race, and this is certainly what I've tried to do, um, is embrace the conversation, uh, and it can be particularly hard uh, for, frankly, white men in positions of power to, to embrace that conversation, not to be defensive about it, um, but to embrace it and to listen, to validate, and to learn, and try to bring people together. But you're only going to be able to do that if you're willing to stay at the table um, and um, reflect and listen and try try to make progress, and that's what we're trying to do, and I really appreciate your help. CJ, this uh, bill proposes to expand your ability to investigate bias and motivated incidents and enforce civil penalties. Do you feel you don't have that ability now? Um, I'm going to defer to Julio on, on that, Senator. Okay. Um, I think he's the subject matter expert on, on that. 
I appreciate the question. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, Graham, do you do a brief walk through the bill? Um, and obviously, like any bill, there may be changes coming, but uh, if you have a sign-out sheet uh, available as members of the committee want to sign out, Not limit the sun to some <clears throat> In an unusual year of taking up bills that have yet to been introduced. <laughs> we've been doing but the we're same doing that thing. this year like I've never seen before, but um, we appreciate the hard work of our staff and the legal division and the proofreading division. They've got this year. Mm -hmm. Senator Campion, that's not. Senator Campion is introducing all these bills on my note. <laughs> Go ahead. So, good morning, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. As you mentioned, this bill is not introduced yet. Um, it also hasn't been proofed yet. Um, as you mentioned, we have quite a backlog in our drafting operations team, so um, forgive any errors. So I'll just do a quick walkthrough. Um, section one, this is a, the civil penalties section of law within our injunctions against hate motivated crimes chapter. Um, so as Senator Ben pointed out, this the, the, the new language of subdivision B um, says that the attorney general or the state's attorney um, can investigate violations of the um, injunctions against hate crimes chapter or the hate crimes chapter. Um, by using the same civil investigation methods that they use for um, in the consumer protection chapter. So this provides that those investigators can um, investigate documents, collect documents, and those documents wouldn't be um, public. They would have to be kept confidential. And can, can I ask the question that was asked before? Is, is this currently one of the powers of the AG, or is this establishing so it, it's one of the powers of the Attorney General with respect to the consumer protection statutes. Um, so it would be providing that for these types, for hate-related crimes, um, bias-related crimes, they would have that same authority um, as they do under the consumer protection chapter for investigation. And again, I would, def I would like, I imagine Julio can give you some more specifics about what that means. So section two creates a bias incident working group um, composed of a member from the state's attorneys and sheriffs, the office of the attorney general, the association of the chiefs of police, criminal justice training council, Vermont State Police, and the Department of Public Safety. And they're tasked with um, analyzing the issues that involve the uniform reporting of bias motivated incidents among all law enforcement. Um, so they are Specifically, if you look at their duties under Subdivision C, they're tasked with establishing a method to standardize reporting, um, including how to consistently code incidents and ensure accurate data is collected and tracked and um, create a standardized referral system um, for, for those incidents to either appropriate law enforcement or community-based entities. And then lastly, on page three, they're tasked with reporting their findings and any um, recommendations for legislation to the Justice Oversight Committee in December of this year. <clears throat> Section three of the bill, this, now we're moving into Title 20. This is the um, statute that deals with minimum training standards for law enforcement. Um, this is suggested language that came from the Arab American Institute that would require some additional training, be a part of basic training, um, and that includes training on hate crimes and bias incidents. And it also requires that those trainings be approved by, um, in addition to the Criminal Justice Training Council, also the Attorney General. And lastly, section four on page four um, requires a report from the Attorney General, an annual report starting next January um, that includes the number of criminal charges, um, filed for a violation of the hate motivated crimes statute and the cross burning statute, including some specific information about those incidents, um, the number of bias motivated incidents that were referred to law enforcement for a community based entity, and a review of the training programs 
um, that are designed to educate law enforcement about hate motivated crimes and bias related incidents. Thank you. Yep. Questions? And, and let's, let's keep, I've got a whole bunch of witnesses, yeah. so keep them brief. Well, this question may be better suited for somebody else then, but in terms of the composition of the, would that be a better question for somebody else around the composition of the uh, working group? I don't know. Uh, well, I just wondered why why the sheriff's association wasn't there. It's, it's the state's attorneys and sheriffs, but the state's attorney and sheriff's department doesn't represent the sheriffs in terms of anything other than budget. Right. So the sheriffs are so they may so they may need to be included. Yeah. I so okay. okay again I okay I circulated this to some people and asked for feedback. Okay, but there are you may need to add. Some. Okay. Any other questions? Green, thank you very much. Thank you, Julio Thompson, the Chief of the Civil Rights Division, and I think Good morning. Good morning. I'm, as you said, I'm Julio Thompson, Director of the Attorney General Civil Rights Unit. Um, and I testified before this committee before to talk about the bias incident reporting system, which is basically uh, a still uh, ongoing and developing uh, network, really, from uh, the, the ground up, from police departments to state's attorney's offices to our office to the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Human Rights Commission and to community groups for incidents that are reported uh, to any of us um, that are either criminal in nature or might violate civil laws such as housing or employment discrimination, or that might be matters of uh, First Amendment protected speech um, that uh, that community groups want to respond to, and, and we hope that when they do that, they're uh, doing it in a way that's uh, that's peaceful and lawful, uh, even if it's uh, vigorous. Um, so I, I'm happy to talk about the bill first or, or answer any general questions that you um, Maybe just a general question about the constitutionality. Somebody questioned somebody in, in a uh, comment on one of the articles about this bill questioned the constitutionality of it because you're reporting on speech. So why couldn't you report on everybody who said they hated the library? Um, well, I think, you know, the constitutionality of speech uh, or a speech-related legislation really has to do with whether it restrains or chills the exercise of speech. Um, so right now, if someone makes a complaint to a police department about something they heard at a shopping center or a poster that they saw on a college bulletin board, the police department is going to write an incident report so that they have a, a record of the complaint. Um, and that, um, in, in a lot of those cases, they don't know who the speaker is. Um, part of the bias incident reporting system really is, is to communicate that, that information that they've already recorded. Because it could be that a state's attorney, um, in a given incident that might not be unlawful in itself, might be later relevant evidence if there is a crime, so that you can show a course of conduct uh, by an individual in. Part of the challenge in proving a hate crime is to show the motivation that a criminal act is motivated by bias. But if you are, uh, if you have at hand evidence for the, when you identify a crime, uh, and the question is whether it's motivated by bias, so there would be there would be enhanced criminal penalties. You would want to have access to information to find out whether that individual has engaged in other biased acts, which themselves might not be unlawful but might be relevant to proving the person's bias toward a particular person or, or group that was targeted. Um, so I think when we're talking in this bill, when we're talking about collecting hate crime data or bias incident data, we do want to be careful um, that we are collecting data in a way so that individual's free expression is not, uh, is not chilled, but simply collecting or communicating information that you would ordinarily mm -hmm. get um, I don't think presents a First Amendment issue unless there's action that's directed towards speakers. Is calling somebody a Nazi a hate? 
Is it a crime now? It's, no, I didn't mean a yeah. crime. I meant would this be a reportable, um, and I'm looking at a trail of Facebook posts that you may have seen, I don't know if it was ever sent to you. Obviously, there's uh, all kinds of, uh, somebody who was called a Nazi um, may or may not be, and may or may not hold those views. Would that be a reportable? I think I think the idea, and this is why I think it's why I mean, a, a working group to, to work on these ideas yeah, because, because that's a real yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that got lost in the press conference in Bennington was a person, not Max Mish, who stood up and, and asked some questions and, and had some. What I, I I'm going to say that he made some comments, but people had been calling him a Nazi. And his, you know, I don't know that he, that he espouses those views, but calling somebody that, with that, and that's, I guess, what I would want to make. Sure. So I think that the concept and nothing, you know, the, the criteria for reporting data to the legislature hasn't been set and isn't set in this bill. So that's what would be the working group's job, is that's to determine whether something of that I mean, nature would. I think that's I right. I mean, as repugnant as the things that somebody might say are. That's right. I think that, I mean, the existing network that we're talking about is simply sharing communication when someone calls, makes a call. So sometimes, I mean, someone might say, I went into a town and I felt like I was being followed. And I think it's because I, you know, everyone there doesn't look like me. And they make a police report. Now, whether or not you call that a bias or not, under our current system, we would still get that because we would want to know that there's an individual who feels I mean, we, unsafe, even though there may not be law enforcement action taken. We have a president who, in my opinion, <clears throat> espoused some of that when he called a group in Charlottesville, Virginia, to be, you know, there's good people on both sides. I, that. I mean, that's part of the motivation of my, just my question just now. So, so you mentioned um, enhan an enhanced penalty. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, uh, say, uh, two men are in a <coughs> fight in bar, two black men, mm -hmm. and they're both calling each other unacceptable names. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that, and so somebody's there with their phone and they record this whole thing, mm -hmm. and then is that something that would be investigated as a hate-motivated speech? Uh, it, it might be. Uh, it might depend upon, uh, in a hate crimes case, it might depend upon what the allegations are by the victim, because there might be prior contacts. Well, they're from, fighting over a woman, so and then they get to this fight and they call each other names. I mean, it seems like it's just a regular little bar. Yeah, this bill is not about hate crimes, though. So, what I'm wondering is there an enhanced penalty, though? You, well, there is. Yeah. Well, there is if you're able to prove that. But I mean, state of mind is something that you have to prove in lots of cases. Like a criminal fraud case, you have to show an intent to deceive. In an employment discrimination case, you have to show that the failure to pro promote is motivated by, uh, you know, by racial bias. So you may have a case, for example, and, and we do employment discrimination cases where it might be a pregnancy discrimination allegation where the, uh, the complainant claims that the human resources manager, who's also female, is not accommodating her pregnancy despite the not law requiring that. So, so I mean, we, we do we, that now. Yeah, we do that now. So I mean, it's, it's difficult to find someone's motivation, and, but there, you can prove it. If, if it, the evidence there, you can, sometimes you can prove it by circumstantial evidence. Um, the provision in here, of, uh, I think there was a question about, this is in section one talking about the enforcement provision. I, I just wanted to explain why that could be useful. Um, so currently, if we, if our office or state's office, attorney office were investigating uh, a hate crime allegation on the civil side to find out whether the uh, individual would benefit from an injunction or to see recover damages if there's property damage, uh, either while there is a criminal case or in cases where the prosecutor doesn't think they can prove the case beyond reasonable doubt. To do our investigation right now, the only way we could uh, get a subpoena for records would be to sue, would be to file the lawsuit. Um, and sometimes when we do investigations, we don't know who the perpetrator is. 
and we need access to, to information, but we don't have a subpoena power. So this this basically gives us the ability to do that. We had a case a few years ago, for example, it was reported in the newspaper at a, a local a local college that someone alleged that someone had fashioned a, a, a facsimile of a noose from the paper towels, um, and they didn't know who did it. And our office was looking at it. State, a state local police had looked at looked at it, and our office we didn't know who the alleged perpetrator perpetrators were. And part of the basic information we needed was to find out who were the residents of the dormitory and what, what students attended what classes at what time. But under federal law, we couldn't get that information without a subpoena. And under our current law, we don't have a subpoena. We can't go to court and sue John Doe in order to get a subpoena. So this would give us that, and it would also allow us to, during the course of our investigation, something on Facebook, for example, and, you know, that allow you to get a subpoena to look at a computer? There may be instances where we might get, if yeah, we might be able to find out what information was posted and when, if, if there's an allegation that those things were made and were subsequently deleted. Um, but this would allow us to, to uh, basically, uh, this statute that's referenced here gives us the authority to issue what's called a civil investigative demand or a CID. Uh, we use that on a daily basis in our employment discrimination cases. And it's sort of anomalous that we could issue that, we can use that discovery tool if the racial harassment occurred in the workplace, but if the racial harassment occurred in public, um, we, could, we wouldn't have the same authority. So it, so it sort of fills a gap that, that needs to Mr. Chair, um, I'm wondering about the word standards there. So if yeah. you're talking more to methods, what would change in terms of standards and what a standard is um, so the, the statute that's talking about, um, that's referenced here, 9 BSA 2460, not only says that the office can issue a subpoena, the equivalent, this civil investigative demand, but also the statute requires the Attorney General's office to keep the information they, they obtain confidential unless they have the consent of the individual providing the information or it's permissible uh, through a court order, so if you're going to court on something. Um, because sometimes you will interview somebody where an individual will provide you information uh, pursuant to that authority and you can protect it. Otherwise, the concern is that the perpetrator or people who are sympathetic to the perpetrator could issue a public records uh, request and obtain the, the contents of our investigation and that might chill reporting. That's why we have that, that level of confidentiality for employment cases right now. So. That's the reference there to the standards. It's an obligation upon us that we have, it's not just that we may keep it confidential, we have to unless we, we obtain the consent of the individual. And when we're, typically when we're going to enforce things, we get that consent. And if I could just ask one more. Sure. So is the, I'm just trying to, it's hard not to put it into the context of the, the Bennington <coughs> sequence of events. Um, Go ahead. Oh, okay. So uh, the Attorney General was unable to proceed under current law. So this would give different investigation methods, standards. Um, would, I know this is kind of an obvious question, but would the Attorney General theoretically be able to apply this $5,000 penalty even if there's not a criminal violation? And is that part of the intent of putting it into this chapter? Uh, now I think part of this chapter, this amendment right here, uh, is an amendment to the existing provisions that say if the Attorney General or the State's Attorney's Office find, think that they can prove by a preponderance of the evidence in a civil case that someone that committed a hate crime or that an injunction is necessary to prevent the, the future commission of hate crimes, um, then they can use the, the larger provision offers three sorts of civil remedies, injunctions, damages, and a state penalty, which is the $5,000 penalty. I think it's just added here because this is the next okay. section in order. So, so I, I'm just having a hard time um, realizing whether or not the Attorney General had this civil power prior to this. In other words, when the investigation was done in Bennington, could the Attorney General have 
gone for a civil penalty under a preponderance of the evidence? And if he, if he could not have, is this an attempt to give him that power? If he could have, then, then this wouldn't have affected his decision in that case. Well, the, the decision about it, out of Bennington related to many incidents. I yeah. think that the sequence was over 40 paragraphs. Uh, the great majority of those incidents, there was no identified perpetrator. So no one you could sue or no one you could arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was an allegation, for example, about um, someone paintballing a political sign. Um, don't know who did that. So couldn't prosecute that, the change in the law. For, for the great majority of those, those instances, there was no identified person. With respect to the people that were identified who made statements, they were really of two categories. One was basically racist, demeaning comments, calling someone racist names. Uh, and, in, and in the context that, of the evidence that was provided to us, that's not, you can't prove either under a civil case or in a criminal case that that's a hate crime because uh, offensive speech on its own uh, is not prosecutable. It's offensive, but the First Amendment provides broad latitude for all sorts of names. Um, lots of, especially when you're in the context of uh, political figures. Um, there have been two cases before the Supreme Court where individuals were able to prove to a jury that the speech involved in a given case met the standard for intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is a common law cause of action. In order to, in order to uh, prove that common law uh, uh, cause of action, you have to show that someone engaged in outrageous and reprehensible conduct beyond what society can endure. You have to show that the person intended to cause injury to the victim, and you have to show that the victim suffered damage. And in both of those cases, they were the, the plaintiff, the individual who brought the claim, uh, was able to prove those elements and win substantial damages in front of the jury. And the US Supreme Court in both case, cases overturned it because the speech, the speech was malicious, but there were no false statements, no libelous statements, and it didn't meet any of the other categories of unprotected speech, such as obscenity um, uh, or words that are, uh, that are used to uh, incite immediate violence. It was just vile spewing of hatred toward an individual. Um, so we have two cases. In both cases, um, uh, I, I think there were eight justices uh, on both. One, one justice dissented on one case. The other case of one judge did not take part in the case. So it's not, that, that issue is not really hotly debated within the Supreme Court. Um, and with respect to the other statements, um, they didn't re reach the level of a threat. They were vague and ambiguous. Um, uh, I think one of them referred to the word trolling, which um, mm -hmm doesn't really have a fixed meaning and in context, I don't think you would be able to show uh, in one, in, in either in a civil forum or uh, in a criminal forum that that was prosecutable and outside the bounds of the First Amendment. What we're really talking about here with this particular amendment is allowing us to do more investigation, to be able to obtain more evidence without, um, without having to take a case to court. In some cases, we might not take to court. Senator Benning. But with this statute, you gain subpoena power? Would that include subpoenaing someone for a deposition? Uh, yes. So if the Attorney General decided to pursue the Bennington case further, and this were law, you would have the ability to subpoena people in and actually put them under oath and require them to answer questions. If we had evidence that, that um, the subpoena were necessary, to, that we had some evidence that there was a violation of the law. We can't just randomly, under our existing authority, let's say in an employment discrimination case, we could subpoena witnesses or records, and if they don't voluntarily come in, if they don't want to speak to us, we would have to go to court and show a court, this, this evidence is necessary because we have this evidence suggesting 
that there is a that there is in this case it would be a hate crime and in, in the employment context it would be employment discrimination. So it's not <clears throat> a license to go on a fishing expedition. In fact, the, the Vermont Supreme Court has already interpreted the law, this statute uh, 2460, to uh, prohibit that sort of exercise of government power because that really would be formidable and could be subject to abuse. I think the court said. Another, another question. Um, last section four. <clears throat> Line 13 talks about a hate-motivated crime injunction. I'm assuming we're not talking about conditions of release or a probation condition. Is there a civil injunction that's ever been issued in this state based on the fact that someone was convicted of a crime for this particular area? We've had cases and <clears throat> we've had limited experience with uh, hate crime injunctions because typically if we have a person to identify and there's evidence of a hate crime, the, the, the relief that would be provided in a civil injunction would just typically stay away from the victim or the family or certain uh, locations would be a condition of release. But we have had, case, we have had cases um, long ago where, uh, where in individuals would agree to a hate crimes injunction where the prosecutor's office, uh, it, the hate crime may be part of a larger uh, set of charges in that case may be proceeding, uh, but the prosecutor may not elect in a given case to seek a hate crimes injunction, or a hate crimes enhancement, because you recall it's a higher standard of proof to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a criminal act was maliciously motivated. And in our experience, in the discrimination context, I think the example you gave where there might be some other motive present as well, so we have a mixed motive case, those are tough cases to prove even on a civil standard. Uh, but yes, we have, we've had a few of those cases. Every time we, we learn of a case that is subject to a hate crimes uh, uh, charge, or there seems to be a bias element, our office already uh, communicates with the state's attorney's office, uh, the, the responsible state's attorneys who are handling the case, uh, to, to identify what the terms of release, might, conditions of release might be. For example, in the KKK Flyers case, that's a perfect example. That case, the individual uh, who was arrested and charged actually never made bail, and so he was incarcerated. Um, but that was a case where we were poised, if necessary, to go to the two victims and get a hate crimes injunction and keep them away from them. And that got thrown out. I'm sorry? That got thrown out by the Vermont Supreme Court? Yes, the Vermont Supreme Court said that, that, uh, that the uh, distribution of those flyers didn't meet the uh, threatening standard that was in the uh, distur uh, disorderly conduct statute. But the state's attorney in that case, who showed the name, was, got, got the injunction, and then the Supreme Court, so the guy went to jail, but the Supreme Court overturned it. Is that correct? That's right. There was the, that, I think the state's really attorney was T.J. Dunham. It was. He was the state's attorney, and I was still in the attorney general's office. Yeah. Um, uh, that was a case where it really was a gray, a gray area as to whether um, the, the circumstances there, which wasn't just distribution of the flyer, but it was actually sticking it in the, sticking it in in the, the doors. The uh, and that case resulted in a dissent from Justice Robinson. So it was a, uh, you know, it was a close, it was a close decision in some respects. So, so how does this ability to the attorney general and the state's attorney, and I may misunderstand the way um, investigations like this are handled, but how does this impact the um, local and, um, police agencies and the Vermont State Police? Does it have any impact on their ability no. to, to investigate or to... No, and typically if the okay. police would do that. I mean, they could speak to that themselves, okay. but they would do that through the exercise of search warrants okay. um, or voluntary con contacts, informants, uh, their own online research, and so forth. Great. Anything else? I'm happy to talk about whatever you want to. No, no. Okay. Um, are there other questions for who? If not, Aaron, then um, I think we'll move on, but okay. hopefully you'll be here sure. as we work on this bill to answer yes. various questions. I, I'm reminded of uh, well, the U.S. Supreme Court on a 5-4 to four decision, decision found flag burning to be protected speech. So, there's Johnson versus Texas, 1989. Johnson versus, yeah. yeah. My last year of law the reason that comes to my mind frequently is as a freshman 
Vermont State Senator in 1993, we had a resolution to urging, you know, Congress to overturn or somehow overturn that decision to rewrite the law. It was a, called the flag burning resolution. And there was a lot of discussion about whether that should have been protected speech or not. Um, well, I would add one of those d difficult votes as a, you know, you're just first here, you know, it's the last thing on your mind when you get elected to the Vermont Senate that you're going to be asked to vote on that. Um, and I, I voted to, uh, to reject the resolution, uh, which wasn't popular in a lot of my uh, communities. But I would not sure that, that uh, Julius Kahn. Mm -hmm. Julius Kahn said, um, was, uh, active in that, uh, Rob Hyde and my dad. The Republicans actually controlled the Senate back then, and it was a priority of the uh, pro tem and some of the other members. Um, and so they were really upset when we um, voted it down because the resolution had passed the House. I could just add to that that after Johnson versus Texas was struck down by the Supreme Court, U.S. Congress did, in fact, pass a federal law that was virtually identical to the Texas law. There were over 450 members of Congress who voted for it, and you know they took some here, I think, in the in the Senate. And law professors said it would be struck down by the Supreme Court because of the ruling in Johnson versus Texas. And a year and a half later, in a case called Early Ehrlichman versus United States, the Supreme Court struck down the federal law as well. So they, they ultimately did pass the law, which was found to be unconstitutional. But again, it was not something that I campaigned on. Certainly, I would never expect it to be voted. So, thank you. Sure, I'll stay. Uh, next witness is uh, and who, uh, John Campbell, the executive director of the state's attorneys and sheriffs, who would be part of the working group. So. Uh, happy to have you here and are you willing to be a part of this working group? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Chair, we are. <clears throat> uh, John Campbell for Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Attorney General for coming forward with this. This is, uh, this is an issue that uh, some people call it the slam dunk, other people go, wait a second, what are you doing? And um, it takes a lot of courage to, especially when you're in a political position, uh, to take uh, such a stance. But I believe very, uh, as he does, I believe, um, we can't stand by as um, a country and let a small group of angry, uh, warped people, you know, create this environment of anger and fear. And more importantly, we can't let them create what the norm is. And kind of what you said before, back in, when they did the cakewalk. You know, that was norm back here in Vermont. We didn't have uh, that sensitivity back then. But right now, we go over this country, uh, every play, every time I open up the paper or look at something online, it's, it's somebody's saying, uh, some, you know, making some angry statement about somebody else. And unfortunately, uh, some of the leaders of this country have made it to, to be uh, uh, passe and, and almost like this is the, the way to do things, this is the way to operate, this is the way to have social interaction. And uh, I personally find that extremely offensive. And I think that anything we can do as a state to try to uh, uh, make others aware that this is not acceptable, uh, then that is, uh, that's, that's extremely important. And so even though this one section deals with uh, whether we can deal with uh, this in a criminal or civil uh, arena, I think also part of what we should be discussing uh, and what I hope to be discussing in part of this group is how we can go out into our communities and how we can to try to uh, inform um, the not only our peers but uh, you know, the, the younger people uh, of, uh, of the state that uh, this is not acceptable. And uh, so, um, I'm, again, I fully support uh, the, uh, the bill. I believe there are things that, uh, and I think we had mentioned this, that need to be, um, uh, we need to sit down and talk about things and, and uh, determine how best to uh, create this, uh, 
whatever the reporting, you know, what, what actually is biased to, you know, come up with different definitions. Uh, so there's definitely work to be done. Um, however, I think this is the, uh, a great foundation on which to build. For individual state's attorneys around the state, one of the things that we found, that I found difficult is determining anything statewide. I mean, and with, no matter what it is, there's cultures in various districts. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about racially not related incidents. But how can we develop a statewide system that um, accurately covers these so that we're not picking on certain areas of the state? Now, I'm going to use for an example, I just got a report from the Center from, I keep calling it the Center for Justice Research, but it's the Crime Research Group, that debunks the UVM um, racial bias reporting system. And this was presented to Chief Paul Toussaint of the Bank and Police Department. I don't know if you've seen this, but it, you know, it really does um, talk about the methodology. So it said, and I'll give you the conclusion, a previous study by Segrino and Brooks on driving black and brown in Vermont was conducted using 2005-2015 data. The data issues an incorrect methodology affect the analysis conducted for the study and might make the study's conclusions questionable because of the numerous flaws in the study. We do not consider their findings and conclusions of racial bias to be conclusive. So you have Bennington called the racist police department, etc., based on the findings of something that a group that we use frequently here to get information about statistics and other things about Vermont crime. We used them the other day on marijuana. So they're saying that that methodology, the damage has been done. And I, I'm curious as to if, if this working, I want this working group to work. Obviously, I would co-sponsor the bill with, and I do appreciate the Attorney General's work here, but we do need to find accurate me measures for our police departments, our state's attorneys, so that we don't have this kind of, um, you know, whether this is accurate or not, I don't know. But it's there. It's a public document, I guess. Um, and, and I don't know that it tells me that Bennington didn't. It seems to indicate that um, it talks throughout about the flaws of the previous study. Um, I think many people have talked about some flaws in that study before. I think so, but but people yeah. use that study. That's what I'm, I want to make sure is clear. People use that study to claim that certain departments were um, biased, that had biases, and not necessarily racist, but biases. And if that study is inaccurate, so what I want to assure, I want to be assured that this working group will will work so that whatever comes up with its methodologies to determine these things don't I, have that. I can thing. speak to some of those methodology issues. Okay. A clear point if you want. Okay. Yeah, maybe it, maybe not right now, but that's the so that's concern because you do represent 14 diverse states attorneys. I, I can assure you, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, the person that will be on this, this panel, and uh, I can assure you that uh, I will be uh, making sure that we don't leave any rock on turn to make sure that, that we're not uh, just labeling like some people sometimes will throw labels out there uh, and they stack and it can be on both sides but I think it's clear is that that implicit bias is there we, we all have our biases we understand that um, now if somebody would look at the intention if they read that initial report they would think that most you know police officers are pulling uh, people of color uh, uh, over uh, at an alarming rate. And uh, I think, again, uh, Major Jones is probably the best to talk about. It. She's done an incredible job with the uh, yep. Vermont State Police and worked very closely on this uh, bias uh, policing. Uh, but I think that there are, you know, two, as there is always, as Paul Harvey said, you know, now that here's the rest of the story. story. But um, <clears throat> I just think that, uh, again, going back to what are we trying to achieve here? And I think that. I wish this wasn't even necessary, okay? But we are living in an age 
where, um, again, when you have the President of the United States sitting up there and calling people uh, all sorts of names, vile names, uh, and people now find that it's fair game to go ahead and just tell everybody what you think. And this is not about politics. This is about an individual. I don't care if he was a Republican, Democrat, or Independent. It didn't matter. It's the fact is we have a person who leads the, what is arguably the uh, strongest country in the world and should be one of the most advanced countries in the world. And he's up there like a petulant little child telling, you know, if he doesn't like somebody, he's you know, figuring out some nickname to call him. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, again, yeah, it's funny when you watch it sometimes, uh, say, I can't believe you said that, but unfortunately there are people who are just sucking it up and thinking, that's right, he's right, he can say that and I can say it. In fact, it's my duty to go out there and, and, uh, uh, and make these comments to other people. And what it's resulting in, I think, is, uh, you know, even to our schools or our grade schools and, and high schools is, is bullying. People, you know, think it's, again, fair game to call anybody what you want. Um, so all I can say is that any step that we take as a, as a, as a state uh, in order to um, recognize that uh, we have, uh, that our, we're made up of many different uh, races, uh, religions, and that we all do have to get along, or we all should get along, um, we need to be able to realize that we have to temper things we say or do. And I'm hoping that when we, as this group, gets together, and I think the, I agree with the Senator uh, that the sheriffs probably should have a, a, a spot on this as well. But I, I think when we get together, <coughs> we have to look internally and see how um, are the people that we represent, how are we perceived, and what can we do? How, what kind of a, a job, or what can we do to better, um, uh, better ourselves and in the way we look and handle crime or uh, things in the criminal justice system. And uh, <clears throat> so I think I think we can do it. I've been doing um, racial uh, uh, training with the state's attorney since I started uh, back in 2000, the summer of 2016. And uh, this actually uh, is going to be one of the training uh, areas this summer as well. So um, we're doing what we can and, and I'm gonna do anything uh, that I can personally to uh, to make sure to facilitate uh, any type of programming or change that needs to be to create um, the feeling and the understanding that when we deal with somebody on a prosecution standpoint, we're not looking at the color of their skin, their religion, uh, their politics, nothing. We're looking at whether or not a criminal act was committed and um, what we do from there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Any questions for John? Thank you. Do you want to just briefly, before we take a break, will you comment on that? Yes, Michael. Mike. Yes. Question about the different <coughs> to making sure that we have uniform. <coughs> Yes, again, Julio Thompson, Attorney General's Office, Civil Rights Unit Director. I, and, and I apologize for omitting a brief discussion about the working group report here. Um, uh, so some of the work that the Attorney General's Office has already done is a, a few weeks ago, um, there was a national symposium on hate crimes among state attorneys general. Uh, it was at the Museum of Tolerance in the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles. And part of the discussion, a big part of the discussion there was about what data to collect and how to collect it to make sure it's not misleading, and also to make sure that um, the, the, the collection method, methodology as well as the, the charge for law enforcement to report incidents isn't so burdensome that um, you have reduced compliance by officers but who have calls to answer and cases to work. Um, and one of the experts there was a, a gentleman named Dr. Brian Levin, who heads the uh, uh, Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State San Bernardino. Uh, he's testified before in Congress, uh, I think a half dozen times, about hate crimes reporting. And he offered us a critique about existing laws uh, collected from different jurisdictions about collecting and reporting hate crimes data. Uh, the important thing for a lot of us there was to see whether this, the center would be willing to work with states to provide us some technical assistance. And he's indicated favorably that he'd be willing to work with some of our states. And so we want to make sure we collect the data. With respect to this draft of the bill, I might point out, and I, and I know this is a preliminary draft, but 
um, you know, when it talks, when the working group's talking about law enforcement reporting bias incidents, I think part of the, uh, maybe I, the clarification in the bill is that we're really talking about reporting, for, for the police reporting crimes and collecting data on crimes, and I think our office, the Attorney General's office, would be best situated to talk about the it, other it, incidents. If you could work with Brynn on any changes sure. for the bill, obviously uh, we're doing it's early days. I early days work. That this is rare that we have a bill that's just in draft form. So if you could do the uh, do the work, uh, you know, would save us a lot of trouble is, in terms of markup. But I would be. I, I really do caution us to make sure that whatever we do is uniform statewide and not with differences because. In Burlington, somebody looks at something and differently from Montpelier, who might look at to different from Brattleboro. And, and we want to make sure the data we collect is actually useful, that we can do something with right. it, that it will mean yeah. something. And also that, again, that it's not so onerous on law enforcement agencies to provide that information that you might have non-compliance or inconsistency if there's too much um, detail for them. Thank so. you. I'm Inga Jonas with Vermont State Police. Um, I'm a division commander in the State Police. And, uh, my division is the Support Services Division. And one of the areas within my division is our Fair and Partial Policing Mission. And Lieutenant Gary Scott was here earlier. He was the, the current director. I was the first director of Fair and Partial Policing. Uh, so he and I sort of lead our department's efforts. And, and I, I know I've spoken to folks on this committee or been in the community of different forums with folks, some folks on the committee uh, regarding different aspects of our overall mission. Um, and so it's really holistic in terms of how and who we recruit and the sort of values that we put forth about our organization in terms of attracting people to our organization, all the way up through policies and procedures and, um, and data collection and the other sorts of more commonly um, viewed things that have to do with quote unquote fair and impartial policing, which, which is essentially just ethical policing and um, constitutional policing. Um, so having said that, um, I, I'm really happy to have been invited to be here. I don't have a really clear, um, you know, mission in speaking with you. I want to answer questions. I think in some, what I want to say is that um, you know, all police officers, um, the issue of hate-motivated crimes or bias-motivated incidents is incredibly important to us because we are sometimes the first ones to receive complaints of this sort, and we uh, are critically aware of the unique impact that these crimes or incidents have on victims and beyond just individual victims, but communities as a whole. So, we really need to be at the table, if not leading the discussion around hate and bias motivated incidents. There's also the unique factor that certain groups can feel afraid of police, um, and we have to be very much aware of that and work um, to build trust in communities that are marginalized. Um, and so all agencies need to be working in that regard. Um, I would be very much in support of, or I should say, one of my big concerns has been um, a lack of recognition of, of a hate or bias motivated crime for, and calling it for what it is. We've noticed um, some lack of awareness in terms of properly coding these types of incidents so that they can then be um, recognized for what they are and so our numbers can accurately represent um, what it is that we're responding to in the community. Um, and so and, um, Attorney General Donovan spoke earlier about an effort that we're involved in with his office to go around to each of our barracks and speak with our members to deepen their level of understanding around uh, calling this what it is, when an incident is a crime, but it's also motivated by a bias or hatred, we need to code it as such so we can collect active data and also be properly responsive to the communities that we serve. So uh, there's work being done in that area, and that's important for all law enforcement agencies. Um, 
having said that, I would want us to be really thoughtful in how we go about doing this. And I think the first step is a working group, or whatever we want to call it, so that we can really get a proper definition and good guidelines uh, for all law enforcement and others um, so that we are not sort of confused or um, you know, stuck in our tracks of trying to properly call it what it is, whatever it is. So we need to we need to really deepen our understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about proper response to bias motivated uh, crimes and incidents because there's a difference and we need to be much more articulate and clear and in from uh, how we guide our members in all of our departments around this. So I think it starts with you know, collaboration um, and sitting at the table working together on what are, we, what are we talking about here? And what's the difference between calling someone a Nazi or calling somebody a racist term? What are those differences? And um, you know, I do want to point out that just aware, from an awareness standpoint, um, a lot of the most um, fear-inducing sorts of things are rooted in a power imbalance, right? So um, it's, it may be a little different to call someone a Nazi than it is to call them um, an anti-Jewish slur. Um, and I don't know that I could articulate that really clearly, but I don't think we can take out of the fact, that we can't take away from the fact that their power imbalance is oftentimes at the root of hate and bias motivated incidents and police need to be very aware of that. Um, and one thing I just can't help but say because <laughs> I feel like you'll cut me off if I go on too long, but um, I spent about 10 years prior to becoming a trooper doing gender-based violence intervention, um, talking about violence against women and children. And I joined the state police to continue that work at the University of um, And so it's just interesting. I look back and I think I've spoken to hundreds of um, men. Not all of the men who perpetrate against violence against women, I would say, are doing it based on bias. But a lot of them will admit to you that they commit crimes because it instills fear and it maintains control. And these are the kinds of things at the root of bias and hate-motivated crimes. Um, any police officer you talk to who spent a good amount of time investigating gender-based violent crimes might make that same argument to you effectively. Um, I probably should go back and code the hundreds of cases I've done in the state police as um, the bias motivation code anti-female. But I didn't, and so I think it's a good example of making sure that we're talking about things for what they are. Um, it's very clear to us that if there is a swastika on the side of a barn, that that is a bias-motivated crime of vandalism. Um, but for years and years, we've seen crimes against women, because they are women, being not labeled as bias crimes. I, I don't think we should have like a hierarchy of hate and, and like argue about which is more important, but I just think we all need to have a much better understanding of how these kinds of crimes impact the communities that we serve, and that police really um, should be leading and very much a part of this discussion and getting their folks on board. Um, we're the ones who are seeing this and we're oftentimes the first ones called. Um, so I would be in support of sort of slowing things down and having a working group so we really um, are all on the same page about how to define things. Um, and yeah. Does the charge to the working group in this bill work for what you would hope um, So I have to go back and get it. So creating a working group to establish a system of uniform reporting of bias motivated incidents. Um, that sounds good. It sounds like it's on, I think, I guess part of me just feels like there should be maybe, more to a, yeah, maybe a little bit more to, uh, to it to really flesh it out. And I might not, you know, I'm not somebody who writes laws, but when I hear it and when it really resonates, it, it makes sense it might be a little bit more uh, structure to it. Um, it speaks to reporting, but it doesn't speak to standard. So 
there might be a uniform system of reporting, but you could have everybody adopting a different standard, which would negate the work on right. the uniform right. reporting. Uniform reporting is important. Yeah. yeah. But but having people agree on what what is one of these instances. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So do you want on number one on line seventeen it does say they should establish a method to standardize the system. So do you want that expanded to, uh, to put something specific in there about um, defining defining not just the reporting but defining the um, the definition of what, what gets reported. The, the, the working group needs to spend more time on that up front. I, I, I believe that's true. I think that what, so what happens um, and maybe this gets to what you're asking um, you know, so for dispatchers are the first line of, of um, you know, response when somebody calls in what they've experienced as a crime or an incident that they think could be a crime or something that they're afraid of that happened that makes them need help. Um, so I want to make sure that dispatchers have a much clearer sense of how to properly channel these types of reports. So a dispatcher could say, well, I know right based on my training and experience that that's not a crime. So it wouldn't be necessarily something that a police officer is going to respond to and will result in an arrest. But I don't want that dispatcher ruling out that's still something that impacts the community and has a public safety aspect to it. And so don't cut anyone off at the pass. It's still something that needs to be responded to. So. Um, and the same with police officers. I don't want my people or any police officer to say some, well, ma'am, or well, sir, that's not a crime, so I'm done, my work is done here. There has to be, and this is what I think the, you know, we need to be much better at, is here are some other resources. This doesn't meet the statute of, of a crime. However, it still has a very big impact on all of us because it impacted the community, and therefore, here are some other things that I'm going to um, lead, suggest or lead you to. So, um, I think there has to just be a more coordinated approach, and that police are oftentimes the ones in the position to help make those um, steer people in that direction. So, maybe you could work with um, Julio and Bryn to maybe put some something in there and see if that would be acceptable yeah. to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, that would be the yeah. only way to do it. Did that answer your question? It is. Let's and define it. Let's define it. The other thing would be, it looks like a, a lot of reporting is going on here. Is that practical for police officers? Um, you know, have, it sounds like a lot of things are going to have to be oh, right. we're going on here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if I have a clear answer on that. So which section do you mean? Um, just so you saw it throughout okay. that you're going to be. Um, I don't know if I see that. Do you see that someplace? Method to standardize the system of reporting. How to consistently code, or well, I guess you'll, you'll figure that out. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure, I get that. Uh, standardized referrals. Mm -hmm. Standardized mm -hmm. system of reporting bias motivated incidents. Yeah. Um, I mean, just in terms of some of the examples that were given here, it sounds like there would be a lot of cases, and maybe there should be, that are reported with regard to you know some incidents that in normal day to day life. We're calling each other names that you wouldn't be reported. It sounds like, and maybe I'm misinterpreting this, but it sounds like they would be reported and then an incident would be checked. Whether it was a big incident or whether it led to something else, but it sounds like there'd be a check mark and you'd have to enter a data point or something. Right. Well, like yeah, so we respond to lots and lots of cases every yeah. year that are calls for service. I mean, almost 60,000 calls for service in 2018, not including the traffic stops. Um, the vast majority of those are, are not crimes. They're just the things that people have to deal with day in and day out for which they need someone to answer their call or their complaint um, or their fear. So each one of those has a report associated with it and um, 
you know, those those types of reports or calls for service can have you know can lead to felony charges and and you know affidavits and search warrants, or they can just be a paragraph that says I responded to so and so's house because they were afraid of a sound in the night, and so each one of those cases has is is documented and um, needs to have the proper coding to indicate what exactly it was. So should on this working group, I've asked that we um, include the Sheriff's Association and the uh, Police Association. Should there be somebody that um, specifically represents the dispatchers? Or um, is that too, too much in the weeds? It might be a little bit in the weeds. I okay. think if you have, well, I mean, it's, it's a good question. So in public safety, we, uh, the Department of Public Safety has two of the right. public safety answering points in, but each, each department is responsible for their public okay. safety answering points. All right, so that gets it would too get, much in the public. Yeah, I think okay. it would be I'm covered sorry. through. No, yeah. so I think it's a good question because they really are the first line yeah. of support. So. But once it is identified, then you can once work with it. Once it is identified, then training, and we're already underway with okay. training dispatchers, but that really needs to be formalized. Okay. Thank you. And I think there was some mention before, and we discussed this last month, about are the systems of Valcor and Stillman, I think it is, are they taking in the same information? They are. They're two different systems that are designed to um, take in the same type of information. So they have the same codes? Well, I don't know. The first thing about Valcor, do you guys use Valcor? We do. Um, they're, they're, Just identify. I'm sorry, Chief Tony Fagus, Montclair Police Department. Uh, it, there is some, some latitude for agencies to uh, code certain certain things. The only uh, where it, there's a standard is when it has to do with uniform crime reporting, that it has to be the same for the, uh, the FBI. So so there is latitude. That's something that uh, uh, hopefully will be addressed in this working group. Oh, okay. So, did you have some more? Oh. You have no, no, that's fine. I, um, I think I made most of the points I wanted to make. Uh, but again, I'm happy to answer questions. Can I ask one? Yes, sure. So on page three, um, it asks for the working group to report on its findings by December 2019. If we're going to spend a lot of time or some time defining it before we start doing that, should we um, move that date out? Uh, probably. I would say, I mean, we don't want to go on for too long. We don't right. want to too much time. I think we want to have um, probably, I mean, geez, you're asking me. I think you should get a lot of people's opinion. Okay. I think, you know, I think, um, gosh, I think a year is probably a fair amount of time just given pulling people together and um, it shouldn't go on for too long. Well, this shouldn't be too a year. This is like six months. Right, so that's why so, I think okay, it should be maybe, probably, maybe, maybe yeah. July. Yeah, or something. But okay. Ask other people's okay. opinions. Okay. Ask other opinions. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just there is just one other thing. Yeah. How many? Of, do you know how many communities you've been around to talking about this kind of work? Oh boy. I don't know. That's a good question. We should we should keep better track a lot. Um, yeah, it's kind of a regular ongoing, yeah. and, and with different under different themes or topics, be it policy or like an issue in the community, and then they respond. But some proactive, some reactive. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And then next. Um. <coughs> Good morning. Elizabeth Novotny for the Vermont Police Association. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon the actual language in the bill and then Chief Akis for the Police Association is going to talk a little bit about the role of law enforcement with respect to uh, bias incidents, the effect on the community. So in taking a look at this, uh, I was pleased to hear that the committee recognizes this is a first draft and 
uh, I certainly, on behalf of the Police Association, will work with Julio Thompson and with Brandon on, on, on the language uh, and to make some suggestions, and I'll just forecast where we might go with that. Uh, first, I'll start off with the training piece, which appears on page three of the bill. And uh, this would essentially embed mandatory training for hate crime and bias incidents. We certainly have no problem adding the hate crime piece. That's, that's a, an existing crime, and uh, I think we've heard from Major Jonas that we can, we can always stand to do a better job. And uh, if you would like to include that, we, the Police Association has no objection to adding that um, uh, at this time. The bias incident uh, include, we would recommend you uh, hold off on uh, and allow the working group to first talk about what, what we mean when we say bias incidents. Um, so that when we finally come up with a collective understanding that this legislature has received a report on and uh, and, and approves that we are going to move forward with uh, uh, information that we can actually train to. You can't commence training to something that you don't haven't really put together. So we would recommend that, that we delete that at this time, and that would be uh, something that we would add to the working group's charge. Any recommendations with respect to training? Uh, how would you feel about um, to? effective dates, one for the rest of the bill and one that will move that piece out um, to allow the, yep. the working group. You could do it that way, but I <clears throat> I think that it's possible this working group may have a number of recommends for training around bias incidents that they might want to recommend and you know you could just as easily wait for them to come back to say we want to make sure these are the parameters that we include for mandatory training. How, whatever the will is of the committee, but as long as it isn't required before we actually complete the work around what bias incidents are. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think it is very possible they'll have um, a number of recommendations uh, for you on training that you may want to embed in statute. So. Uh, returning to the original charge, again, uh, we appreciate the willingness to add the Vermont Police Association, and we also agree the sheriff should be added. You want all of the executives for the law enforcement agencies and associations at the table. Uh, this is important work, so you, you need to have that uh, done uh, statewide. In addition, uh, we may have some language changes around the charge of the working group, which seems very focused on reporting bias motivated incidences and coding, but first we have to talk about what is a bias incident as it relates to the duties of law enforcement, right? Um, you could have a, a landlord and a, and a tenant have a dispute, tenant believing that there's a, a, a bias or discrimination in housing. It may not involve law enforcement at all. So we want to be very clear about what we're talking about. Uh, that we, we, we would be uh, training to and coding. So that would in, we would make some tinkering, I think, there to, to make sure that we're, we've got, we've got a broad charge that allows us, allows law enforcement to collectively meet and discuss with the Attorney General's office what is a bias incident within our duties and responsibilities, what are we going to code? And it may not be a report, maybe a referral. We may be providing, as part of training for dispatchers, a decision-making tree um, that would allow the dispatcher to do some work with someone on the other end of the line because the most effective thing we might do in that moment is make an immediate referral to the Attorney General's office. So um, it could be a combination of things, but whatever it is, I think, I think what I'm hearing among all the law enforcement groups is that they want to come to the table on this, they're motivated, and they believe there is a, a place for us to do better with respect to bias incidents and, and to be, uh, I think as Major Jonas put it, we're the first, if we're the first point of contact, then you know, we can be a little bit more proactive. If, if it doesn't fall within our responsibilities because it isn't a crime, maybe we can make a referral as, as one option, and that is a way we can serve the community. And, I think Chief Bakers will speak to some other ideas. So that's all I have to say. Uh, I will commit the 
starting at work with Julio and with Brent as soon as they're ready, but I don't think it's going to be very onerous. I think it'll just be some minor, minor changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming in. Uh, Chief Tony Vickers for the Montpelier Police Department. Uh, here, you know everybody? Do you know? Uh, Phil Bird from Chippy County. Yeah. Here represent the Lamont Police Association. Uh, um, a lot has been said uh, that so I'll be very brief. Uh, so one of the, I believe that this is an opportunity in the, uh, for also law enforcement to lead, uh, specifically in our communities. When there is instance of even bias, which we're not sure yet if it you know hits hits the mark of being a hate crime or not. But it's a, uh, a time can be um, very sensitive to that victim population and how law enforcement responds and, and, and how uh, to that can also set the tone for what's happening in the community because these situations can also deeply divide uh, and challenge any community. So uh, again, VPA is absolutely committed to um, you know working to support the working group and really defining what we want to accomplish because also. Um, I think there's a, a natural sensitivity on this conversation as well, that we're not just um, collecting data on unprotected speech. And, and, and certainly there's a lot of other type of situations that maybe aren't necessarily uh, for this group, but for, I, the I, example is twice I've had to protect the Westboro Baptist Church um, in my career here. Uh, and, and there's nothing, there's no, you know, it's one of the top hate-filled groups out there. But is that that situation? It's really that they, we are protecting them so they can effectively exercise their First Amendment right. Um, with that, yes. You know, so how does that get tracked? So that's where it's a lot of lot of work that will be done in the, in the, in the uh, within the working group. And again, the BPA is fully committed. Um, so again, I, I also the other things where it doesn't just fit in one bucket or another. In other words, is, is it a hate crime or not? Do we track it or not? But sometimes also, I think a lot it's incumbent upon law enforcement to also take a lead in the community. And that can also be in the form of working with community justice centers, um, forums, town hall type formats to, to make sure that we, at the very least, cast a light on, on some, some, some you know, problem areas, especially when anybody is feeling afraid to come forward. This goes to the heart of what we're trying to do to build that trust and legitimacy in terms of policing organizations. So there's a lot of other things I think law enforcement can do, and I think that, that and I think uh, Major Jonas kind of touched upon that, that we always can do more um, to bring our communities together. And these aren't new concepts. Robert Peel believed this back in the 1800s in his nine principles. So, um, but it's something we need to be careful of because these can be extremely sensitive to victims um, about whether or not they are comfortable to reporting, whether it's the culture, whether it's how they may be identified in the public. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of considerations here, and, and also again, what is there's a lot of resources and how do we best leverage the resources for for the victim? Yeah, the Human Rights Commission, Attorney General's Office, and, and even the United States Attorney's Office. So it's a, it's an important topic, um, and it's something that I think law enforcement absolutely has to be heavily engaged in our communities with. And we do need some standardization when it looks like because we also know too it can be hurting cats. Um, from what individual agencies do, whether they're county, state, or local. Um, so we certainly welcome that. And again, all of that will be you know, made clear through the work, through the working group. Uh, I guess I'm wondering, how do you see this um, when you think about the internet and Facebook and horrible things that are said to people mm -hmm. in, in that venue? And how is that, that is, Social media is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly follow the threat assessment, um, whether it's bias motive, hate motivated, or or direct threat of others, and, and sometimes that involves um, resources in other states. And of course, the FBI also we report to the FBI, and they're also tracking hate crimes here in Vermont. Uh, so, so sometimes you can't take action. Sometimes um, you know individual uh, platforms, media, social media platforms. They have an re yeah, internal regulatory process where they could block people, do certain things. But again, when is it free speech, and and when are there other uh, other elements that need further investigation? Uh, this, 
it could be similar to a, a, a counterterrorism investigation. There might be certain ideologies that are put out there in social media, freedom of speech. But when when do you, when is there a totality of, of that speech and other acts and furtherance, physical acts, that maybe this person is intent to do harm? That is the responsibility that's coming upon the law enforcement agency or agencies to 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 investigate fully what what are the next and appropriate steps. And there's and, and the challenge with all of this is that there's not one size fits all. And we have to be very careful not to be so clear in how we define um, X or, or Y as we move forward with this. But it is important that we still move forward with this. Mm -hmm. Seems like that's tricky to report. We'd be reporting those calls about. The group's got a lot of work ahead of us. Yes. Which goes to yeah. that deadline question. Yeah. I think it's also um, important. I'm glad that the uh, that law enforcement is out there in communities and talking about it and stuff because there's a lot of misunderstanding out in the community that likes to um, dump on and blame law enforcement for not doing and for being um, per perpetrating bias. And um, I was at a forum in, uh, once where Lieutenant Scott was there, and he was giving all the statistics for the state police. And somebody insisted that there was this horrible incident in the state police work, and it was from 2011. But the, you could you couldn't drop it because the tape was already there. So it, I'm really happy that that most of law enforcement is out there um, being proactive. So you think it's doable to get all this wrapped up? And I, I do. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but again, I think we just have to certainly be very cautious because there are some pitfalls. You know, some conversations can, can go as far as this could be a modern day McCarthyism. You know? yeah. Again, we, we've got to be very careful that we also protect the First Amendment freedom of speech. So do you agree with, um, as Philip just pointed out, uh, extending the date a little bit for the report to come back and, and the issue around the training? Absolutely. Yes, okay. I think it should be just a, a sufficient amount of time, but I also agree with Dr. Jones, we shouldn't let it go so far out that we right. kind of lost, lost sight of the target. Um, and, but again, the training, we're not in anywhere near ready to talk about the training piece of, until we have clearly defined what, what is the standard here and what are we training to, um, but also be a gatekeeper, uh, and maybe shouldn't be a gatekeeper, but our, how we also train our dispatchers. Well, if we put the working group's term out and we put out the training piece by a year, uh, it seems like we're um, maybe on the timeline uh, yeah. that they should be on. I'm sure it wouldn't be the first time if they have, if, if, if uh, you know, new issues come up that are require more time, I'm sure there'll be hopefully be an opportunity to come back uh, to, to you know to the legislature and say this is where we're at, this is what we need. Mm -hmm. have to go from there. Could, you, could you just mention criminal threatening and what that is? Not in the context of anything. Sure. Uh, for example, if there's threats, because uh, a very you know contemporary example, um, you know, there could be threats to to politicians based on um, how they voted or their positions on, on gun bills. We get those. Yes, you do. And, issues. and and those still require being in, you know looked at. Oh, okay. um, I bet I get the most. <laughs> so um, you know, again, so we're you know, and 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 same thing. If somebody says they're going to uh, really focus on our schools, when we talk about school safety, threat assessment is, is is a vital piece of how do we protect our schools. And so, when, at the earliest opportunity for intervention, we make contact. And it's the same thing that, that the FBI and our, our we do in the in the realm of you know, uh, trying to thwart terrorism. Um, and, it's, and, and the challenge is, we don't know how many times reaching out to somebody, an opportunity to intervene. Um, you know, we don't track that, but certainly we can tell you how many shootings and terrorist attacks we've had. And that's always a challenge with this. And that I see the same challenges, um, how, to, how to report that out and, and track that with, with the, potentially the outcome of what this working group will come up with. But it doesn't mean we don't try to check our schools. That doesn't mean we don't try to stop terrorist attacks from occurring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Elizabeth Novotny for the Police Association. Um, on, on the question of training, I noticed actually um, that Director Gothier is here. Uh, but two things to keep in mind about training, where, whatever, you, whatever you decide. First, the working group has to decide what its recommends are around training. There will be training on bias incident, but what that is we won't be established until they finish their work. But the part two of that is you have to allow the academy sufficient time to put together then the training in response to whatever has been mm -hmm. produced. Uh, and uh, the, the second piece, of, there is language in the bill and it's something that we can revisit that requires the Attorney General's approval for training. I just want to note that it, if the bill is suggesting that it has to be approved by the Training Council and the Attorney General, the Attorney General actually is a member of the Training Council. So the Attorney General's office would be part of the, of the uh, of the body that would be approving the training, so it, it may appear to be a little redundant, but uh, he will certainly have a voice at that training council, and I would say it's a very collaborative group, so I don't imagine that there would be anything but assent to whatever comes out of it. Thank you. So next, uh, Peggy, we have, uh, we have three people coming up that we need to get in here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to call her. Mm -hmm. so. I'm always happy to. Oh. Is this a different person than we heard from before? I think it's a Kaya, person you want to hear from her. This is Kai Wiggins. Kai Wiggins, yeah. Policy yeah. analyst with the Arab American Institute. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to give us something from her? No. Maybe to pass. Morning, Arab American Institute. Hi, can we speak to Kai Wiggins, please? Sure, hang on one second. Up as high as I think it might be. Hello. Hi, is this Kai Wiggins? Yeah, this is Kai Wiggins. Good. Alan. So this is the uh, Vermont Senate Judiciary Committee. There's five, four, or five of us here, and a lot of uh, other people in the room listening from various uh, police departments and our chair of our committee is just returning from a meeting, so he'll take over, and we look forward to hearing from you. So, Senator Sears. Well, thank you. And can you hear me okay? We can yeah. now, yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, giving me a sense of the room, and um, I'm ready to start whenever uh, you are ready. Go right ahead, please. All right, thank you. <coughs> Chairman Sears, Vice Chairwoman Nitka, and fellow members of the committee. Thank you for once again having us speak on this important issue. My name is Kai Wiggins, and I'm a policy analyst at the Arab American Institute. Last month, we had the opportunity to acquaint this committee with our work on hate crime prevention. We also provided two recommendations for legislation that would promote an improved response to hate crime and bias incidents in the state of Vermont. Before I revisit those recommendations, I will first reacquaint this committee with the work of AAI. As a national civil rights organization founded in 1985, AAI promotes the political and civic empowerment of Arab Americans and supports similar efforts of other communities across the United States. As recent high-profile cases of persistent racial harassment in Vermont have shown, bias incidents can disrupt the democratic process and intimidate individuals and their communities from participating in political and civic affairs. When these incidents rise to the level of criminal activity and therefore become what we call hate crimes, the effects can be even more damaging. Beginning in 2017, and in response to a nationwide increase of reported hate crime incidents, AAI conducted a comprehensive study of laws and policies designed to prevent and address hate crime in each state in the District of Columbia, the findings of which we published in a 2018 report. Since then, we have continued our research into the quality and accuracy of government hate crime data, and with the 116th Congress and nearly all state legislatures now in session, we are also tracking legislation related to hate crime in most states. Later this year, we will publish an updated hate crime index based on this continued research. Last week, we received draft legislation from the Office of Legislative Counsel relating to hate crime and bias incidents in the state of Vermont. As proposed, the legislation would expand the authority of the Attorney General to investigate bias-motivated incidents and enforce civil penalties, create a working group to establish a system of uniform reporting of bias-motivated incidents, require minimum training standards for law enforcement officers to include trainings on hate crimes and bias incidents, and require the Attorney General to report annually to the General Assembly 
on hate crimes and bias incidents. We're encouraged with the draft legislation as proposed, but we recommend this committee consider two potential improvements. First, the legislation should require law enforcement agencies to report hate crimes to the Vermont Crime Information Center through the uniform report specified in 20 BSA section 2054. Second, the legislation should ensure stakeholder participation in the process by which the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council and Attorney General approve the hate crime and bias incident training required under section three of the draft legislation. Regarding the first recommendation, the legislation as proposed creates an innovative and promising framework for improving the reporting of bias motivated incidents in Vermont. The committee could strengthen this legislation with provisions requiring law enforcement reporting of hate crimes through the Uniform Crime Reports or UCR system. As the state repository for crime reporting, the VCIC collects UCR data from law enforcement agencies through the National Incident Based Reporting System or NIBRS and forwards the data to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. National hate crime data are collected through the UCR system, whether through NIBRS or the traditional summary reporting system under the Hate Crime Statistics Act. While participation in the UCR is voluntary, 23 states have laws requiring law enforcement reporting and data collection of hate crimes. In draft legislation we submitted to the Office of Legislative Counsel following last month's meeting, law enforcement agencies would be required to report hate crimes to the VCIC in the form of uniform reports specified in 20 VSA section 2054. The VCIC would in turn be required to submit an annual report to the Attorney General based on the information contained in the uniform reports received under this section. With the proposed creation of a bias incident working group, this committee has taken important <laughs> steps toward improving the reporting of bias motivated incidents in Vermont. We recommend the committee get a head start and strengthen the legislation with requirements for hate crime reporting. Regarding the second recommendation, the legislation as proposed incorporates hate crime and bias incident training, which must be approved by the VCJTC and Attorney General into the criteria for all minimum training standards under 20 BSA section 2358. The addition of these requirements is critical and has our utmost support. The committee could strengthen this legislation with provisions ensuring stakeholder participation in the development and approval of the required training. A potential approach rests in the creation of a working group like that proposed in H3. This bill would create an ethnic and social equity standards advisory working group, which would consist of eight members from specific communities identified in the legislation. Communities that are especially vulnerable to hate crime and bias incidents have a stake in the training that law enforcement receive to ensure their safety. That many victims choose not to report hate crimes because of fear or distrust of law enforcement further substantiates this point. When it comes to hate crime and bias incident training for law enforcement, this committee should strive to create a framework that ensures stakeholders have a seat at the table. I appreciate the opportunity to share these recommendations and I commend this committee for working to improve the response to hate crime and bias incidents in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? For... No, it's very thorough. I appreciate that. Can you talk just a little bit about the other states and what they're doing? Is this, uh, have they been in, in law or uh, are they just uh, starting it the same as we are? Um, in regard to reporting or training? Uh, reporting. So um, the state level efforts uh, on hate crime reporting predate uh, the Hate Crime Statistics Act, which was passed by Congress in 1990. Uh, in 1981, Maryland was the first state uh, to pass legislation requiring some sort of uh, reporting and data collection on bias motivated incidents. Um, under you know these statutes, uh, pretty much what's implied or ex explicitly um, uh, directed is that law enforcement should report hate crimes through the UCR program. Uh, and typically, uh, in most states other than Mississippi, there is a centralized repository um, that is designated as a state UCR program, and that program is responsible for forwarding the data collected from law enforcement agencies to the FBI uh, national UCR program. Um, in the state of Vermont, the VCIC uh, uh, is responsible for that um, uh, that task. Well, um, well, so all these. Oh, sorry. Actually, well, the, sorry. actually, my question is more towards you're going to need to report later this year on a hate crimes index based on the continued yes. research. And yeah, um, I'm trying to understand how you will use Vermont dat data. Where you, you know. It would be the hate crimes that have actually been reported. Right, through the hate crimes. So we base our research 
Um, the hate crime index will consist of uh, a study of, as I mentioned, um, laws and policies in place in each state designed to uh, respond to or prevent hate crime. And we also consider uh, data that are collected through the UCR program. So um, we will be considering uh, the, uh, I believe, 34 incidents that were reported through the UCR program from law enforcement agencies to the BCIC and then up to the FBI and uh, published in the FBI's annual hate crime statistics. Uh, which came out in November of 2018. And we'll also be considering the Vermont Crime Online uh, reporting platform, which the VCIC uh, keeps regularly updated. Um, uh, because it, sometimes there, it is the case that agencies uh, submit hate crimes through the system after the publication uh, deadline or cutoff uh, to be um, included in the federal statistics. Um, and I, and I, as I said, 23 states have uh, laws um, explicitly requiring hate crime reporting and data collection uh, through these systems. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your, uh, and as we continue to update the law, we'll try to, uh, or, excuse me, update the bill. We'll try to keep in touch with you so you're aware of some of the changes we may propose. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Chairman Sears, and I appreciate that. Um, I will also mention, and I know um, she was she was invited to um, speak today, but she was unable. Uh, we have been working with Tabitha Pole Moore yep. um, at the uh, Rutland Area Branch of the NAACP on this effort, um, uh, and I, I thought I'd mention that as well. Um, so we're in consistent correspondence with her uh, uh, in regard to updates on this legislation. When we take the bill up again, we may uh, have an opportunity to hear from her as well. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Very thank you much. to everyone on the committee. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, next is the uh, person who has to put all this into training, <laughs> Rick Gothier. Um, <coughs> Rick, uh, does, uh, does this bill add to your? Submitted some written testimony. I think you're familiar with everybody on the committee. Yes. So essentially, uh, for the record, Rick Gothier from Criminal Justice Training Council. Uh, I submitted this uh, late yesterday, so you may not. Yeah. I'll do it. You may not have had an opportunity to read it. Uh, essentially, um, we're looking forward to participating in the working group. Uh, we think that it's a good idea. We think it will prove very useful. Uh, it certainly addresses uh, a need that we've identified through various sources uh, and incidents in the state. The uh, had, a, had a couple of concerns. Uh, the primary concern was that tying the Attorney General to the approval process for training, um, given that the Attorney General is already a member of the Council, um, in effect creates uh, a redundancy and also kind of establishes the Attorney General as a, uh, for lack of a better term, a super member, able to veto the rest of the entire Council for this. So we did have some concerns about that. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make sure that that was at least put on the table. We also noted that um, there was a use of the term refresher course in the, the draft. And what we would suggest is that we actually revert to the term training outcomes, because that will <coughs> That will give an opportunity for a committee to decide what we want officers to learn or what we want them to be trained on in any given in service year. And as you know, we're doing every odd number of years beginning this year. And we put out a couple of, uh, of examples, and certainly not looking to um, get that specific in the draft, but just kind of uh, talking points and thinking points about what uh, training outcomes would look like as opposed to mandated number of hours and then which we have to kind of wedge trainings. 
And then finally, to address Senator Sears' initial comment, um, <coughs> yes, <laughs> this does increase my workload, which, which is fine. Um, we think it's appropriate. The, um, there's a couple of things that I'd like to make the committee aware of, and that the council has a fair and impartial policing subcommittee that is tasked with identifying appropriate trainings, developing instructors, making recommendations to the council for trainings, and currently we're at um, five members. We're going to be looking to expand that to 11 to kind of emulate the training advisory committee and the uh, domestic domestic violence committees. Currently we have uh, the NAACP, the VSP. We would anticipate that when we expand it, we'll start to see more applications from other members of involved communities. And then the, that, that committee would be, as I mentioned, tasked with developing trainings, but also doing reviews of basic training curriculums to ensure that uh, we're staying on top of best practices, staying current with, with developments in the field or in police training. Um, this is, because it's a mandated training, every other year now, just like domestic violence, um, and there are other specific topics with mandated trainings like prepared operation canine. Generally, we have a train coordinator assigned to this. And on the second page of this document, uh, I provided what I provided the House Appropriations a couple of weeks ago in regards to what the duties of this particular position would be. And as you see, it goes significantly beyond just training. It includes liaison duties with uh, Fair and impartial policing groups. It um, manages the fair and impartial policing subcommittee. Um, it acts as a council representative from a number of uh, citizen groups. I would anticipate this individual coming up here to testify in these efforts if uh, if and when needed. Um, they also assist in managing both the base, both the full time to level three, and the part time to level two classes. And. Very importantly, we would be responsible for developing that cadre of instructors that we have to have in order to provide in-service training to every law enforcement officer in the state. We have, we have firearm instructors, we have use of force instructors, we have um, domestic violence instructors. Um, this would fall into that same category. One or two people along at the academy cannot provide this training to law enforcement in any given year. And that's the essential content of my letter. I don't know if you were here when um, both Major um, Jonas and uh, Police Chief um, Keiko and Beth Elizabeth um, testified about, instead of including on page three there, bias incident training as required, to add that as a more specific um, thing to the working groups, um, to the duties of the working group, to come up with both what it is and then recommendations for for training. Cool. And, and putting that in there so that would come back as part of the report and the training wouldn't be required then until after you knew what it was. And, and that's right, and we have, I have talked with um, EAG Thompson about uh, incorporating some of that into the basic training and mm -hmm. we'll start this session. So we'll begin introducing that at the level three and the level two training. Okay. But certainly expanding on that, making it clear would be a book. Okay. And, and you're recommending taking out the Attorney General on line eight and 17 because he's already part of the training council? Yes. And we, we lean pretty yeah. heavily on the AG's office when it yeah. comes to these issues. Okay. Good. I have more questions. Thank you. Oh, I do have one question. We all, we keep hearing, uh, and I may be really confused here, which my committee members won't find um, unusual, but the racial disparity panel is what was set up 
to be the um, to look at racial disparity and systemic racism in the criminal justice system. Is that right? To make recommendations to the council for training, right. for law enforcement, and for members of the bar association. And that's the that's the group that Aton is now the chair of. Correct. So, what is the AG's task force? Is that different? Because we keep hearing about the AG's task force on racial justice. Is that a different group, or is that it is a different group? Who is that? I don't know who's on that group. We're not. Okay. All right. I guess I'll ask the AG what that is. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, we look forward to working on your budget request with her. When your time comes before the appropriation committee, I think I know the person in charge of your uh, budget in the appropriations committee, and I'll talk to him about it. Right. Yeah, we can have that conversation. I will have it. Yes. <coughs> That'd be me, actually. I know. That's why I um, said, would you talk to him? Yeah. Uh, so next is Chloe White from the ACLU. Good morning. Uh, this is my first, uh, Chloe White, ACLU. This is my first time testifying for you all this year, so. Yes, I think it is. I'm pleased to be with you. Here. Here. Oh, thank you. I thought you were just avoiding this. Did you have one to Peggy, too? Yes, I've got I, 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 yes. um, I would never purposely oh, do that. One page. <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to comment on this on this draft bill. Uh, you know, despite important gains, we're reminded each day that racism and bigotry remain embedded in the fabric of our democracy and in our state. Um, so we support the bill's intent when it comes to battling these injustices and ensuring Vermont is a welcoming and inclusive place for all. So we do, however, have a few questions or concerns regarding this legislation, however. Um, so regarding investigatory powers, under this bill, um, the Attorney General's Office would have the power to investigate discrimination and hate motivated crimes, just as the office or state's attorney has the power to investigate unfair acts in commerce under 9 VSA section 2460. Um, and according to that section of the statute, whenever the AGO has reason to believe any person to be in violation of consumer protection law, they may examine or cause to be examined any books, records, papers, memoranda, and physical objects bearing on the alleged violations. Um, and while such broad authority may be reasonable in the area of unfair commercial acts, um, we find the grant of similar authority when it comes to possible private, constitutionally protected speech, whether hate-motivated or discriminatory conduct, problematic. Um, in the criminal context, a warrant would be required to demand and obtain such records. And while the standard may be lower in the civil context, we're concerned about allowing such intrusive searches merely due to the reason to believe um, a violation of chapters 31 or 33 has occurred. Um, so we would urge the committee to, to consider um, how to ensure due process rights are respected, even in the context of a civil investigation. Um, so I, I, I would urge you all to look at that. Um, similarly um, to the uh, Arab American Institute, um, we'd also note that the membership of the Bias Incident Working Group uh, created in Section 2 consists solely of members of law enforcement. So we would urge the committee to add other non-law enforcement members to this body to ensure that the group is inclusive of different views and perspectives. Um, my only other thing that I just want to add after hearing um, Mr. Gauthier, is um, about the Attorney General's office, you know, both being on the council and having the approval rights, I, I believe that's almost the same setup as, as FIP, where, uh, wherein the Colonel Training Council needs to look at FIP, but also, uh, fair, sorry, fair and impartial policing, and also the Attorney General's office um, must be the one to say whether an FIP policy is in line with, with uh, our model policy or not. So. I think there is precedent. I'm not commenting one way or the other whether uh, to take them out or not, but they, you know, that I think other groups have brought that up actually almost as a conflict of interest, um, whether you all, in, in the context of fair and impartial policing. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you all. Do you want uh, the questions? 
I'm a little confused by your in the. I, I do want to know. I had a I had an older version of the bill. I didn't receive the new okay. version of the bill this yeah. morning, so my uh, numbers may be off. Yeah, and we're still at the draft stage. We right. apologize for that. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, well, it's unusual that we're dealing with drafts and not a bill is introduced. Um, I'm trying to understand. Is your concern about the, um, the authority to get a subpoena, is that your concern? Would this be, I mean, if somebody says, no matter how biased and ignorant or whatever term you want to use for it, says some vulgar things about somebody based upon their sexual orientation, race, or whatever. You're concerned that granting the broad authority to get a subpoena to look at their computer or whatever else, uh, how did that, you know, are they, are they the ones who put out the news, for example? Um, is that what your concern is? I mean, uh, because it basically is protected speech, no matter how vulgar or how repulsive it is. Right. Well, I think we'd, um, you know, if within the statute it says if the attorney general has reason to believe that a violation has occurred, they can look at books, memoranda, and so on. So I think that. Um, you know, if there is a subpoena process whereby, you know, they have to go to a court to ask for this, that is more of a grant of due process that, that we would we would appreciate. I, I can speak to that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, I apologize Julio for not. brought up, during Julio uh, Thompson's testimony, he brought up the news. So let's take that. That is a hateful symbol <clears throat> that was produced. But, but who's responsible for the news? Uh, and how do law enforcement or the attorney general investigate who's responsible for the news and is that the, is that what your concern is or our concern is is you know maybe i'm not understanding your sure and i apologize if i'm not uh explaining um and i apologize too i wasn't able to fit into the room when, when julio was speaking so he may have addressed this i think you know because the statute right now um under 9 vsa section 2460 says that when the Attorney General has a reason to believe a violation of, right now, it's unfair acts in commerce has occurred, uh, you know, they are able to obtain these books, uh, papers, memoranda bearing on the alleged violations. We would, we would hope that there would be some sort of process, due process involved in how those books, memoranda, and so on, and so on are obtained. In the, in a, if this were a criminal investigation, there would have to be a warrant to obtain, you know, uh, someone's what's on someone's bookshelf, or do they have the anarchist cookbook or something like that? We would want to ensure that there are some sort of due process protections here. And if there is a subpoena whereby the court needs to approve it, that is better due process. But I think, you know, ensuring that it's not just the attorney general saying we have reason to believe that this person is bad, so we're just going to go into their house and grab you know, anything, grab their computer. Um, so having some sort of due process protection around that, just ensuring it's there um, would, I think, uh, would, would be helpful. And are there other questions about that? That helps me understand mm -hmm. the point of view. Who, uh, maybe if Julio could. Sure. Sure. I would appreciate that. If you might respond to that and perhaps to uh, the comments from Mr. Goff here about the Attorney General being the super member of the group. Okay. Uh, sure. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. <laughs> so the, the civil investigative demand, that's what's referenced in 9 BSA 2460, is essentially the equivalent of, of a subpoena. It is the tool that our office has used um, for probably 20 years in connection with cases of employment discrimination. And that authority extends not only to employers, but if we have reason to believe that there's a witness who has evidence, um, then we can issue a CID on those individuals as well. But the way the process works is that a person has served one of those, and 
uh, doesn't want to comply, then we have to go to court and get a court order to compel them to comply with us. The burden isn't upon the individual to seek a protective order in court. The burden is on our office to go to court and seek an order. In order to do that, we would have to provide the court, typically through affidavits, sometimes with exhibits, uh, and if some of the materials are confidential, they would be fi they may be filed under seal uh, because we may not want the target to know what evidence we have against him or her. Um, so that's that, there is a due process mechanism that's built in it, and we refer to it because it's a tool that we've been using in our office for it's almost two decades now, and uh, and we haven't had any issues with it. So. Senator, um, I I was speaking a little bit about this at the break. I, I do think it's an expansion of, of the power um, and one worth thinking through. And, and I hear what you're saying, which is that ultimately a subpoena uh, or a court um, intervention might be necessary if the, if the subject refused. But the reason for going to it um, in this language would be to produce cooperation in the majority of cases because they would just be told you have to give us these documents and might not might not know that uh, that they have the right to uh, to go to court or or just might be um, I don't know afraid once they receive the CID as you called it that um, that they now have to comply so I I guess it does put a lot of power in the hands of the attorney general in terms of investigative authorities and am I am I being paranoid that it that it might not just apply to one person but that it might apply to in the Bennington case there were a number of people who were involved and there were questions about who was telling the truth so might the attorney general under some circumstance use these CIDs on multiple people to try to figure out what's going on we would, to begin with, before we would issue a CID and indeed before we would initiate a hate crimes investigation where we would, we would engage in that, we would have to identify conduct uh, that we believe violates the law, that violates the civil standard. So if, if there is a case where someone is engaging in expression that is reported to us and someone's complaining of it, and if it's our assessment that that's protected speech, we're not going to use the CID authority because the standard we approach when we when we exercise it, let's say in the employment context, right? Because the person could be alleging a hate crime and it could be coming from a coworker. So we already have that CID authority. And if we're going to investigate it, we have to have some reason to believe that there is there's a violation of the law that we can identify. Uh, and it is a commonplace for us, for people to come to our office, ask us to initiate an investigation and say, for example, I want my supervisor to be investigated because he made a remark about how I looked in a, a particular outfit. Uh, and if that's the only comment and those are the only circumstances, that's a case we don't open an investigation in because our standard is, could we articulate to a judge? Um, we have reason to believe that person may provide us information under oath that there's something that, if true, violates the law. Uh, and when we do issue a charge or a charge of discrimination that's signed under oath. The standard always being, if a person, if we serve a charge on and say, please respond to these allegations, um, our operative assumption is, if they say no, can we get a court order? Um, so that's routine. But your, your point earlier about people willing to be cooperative but being maybe precluded from providing information unless they're served with a subpoena, yet yeah, that is, that is common, and we do that in an employment context. It could be, for example, that we have uh, information where we're investigating alleged discrimination in the schools uh, among faculty, and there may be either contractual provisions or state law provisions or federal laws that preclude our office from investigating a case of, say, racial or sexual harassment um, unless we have certain records and we serve them with the CID. And I, I, I take your point about yeah. the standards that the AG office in real life with T.J. Donovan as, as the AG. I, I, I credit them because I know, I know him, I know you, I know uh, how your office is function. I'm speaking maybe more generally to the powers it would give anybody in that office um, going forward. It's, it's a broad 
it's a, it's a broader authority. So that's that's my, um, you know, not saying I oppose it, but it's something to think about because it's been in a limited commerce context. Now we're going out into any place where somebody alleges that uh, you know a bias incident has occurred. Well, I wouldn't say any. I wouldn't say any place. For example, if someone alleges housing discrimination. We don't have a legal authority. If, it, if, it, if the conduct is not a crime, we don't have the legal authority to do that. So we refer to those cases either to HUD, uh, yeah. through the U.S. Attorney's Office, or to the Human Rights But Commission. I mean on any, any street, anywhere in the state, um, one of these incidents could occur. We would, have, we would have to have a basis in this context for saying the allegations are true, the evidence is pointing towards the commission of a crime that's motivated by bias in the same way that we do right now where we say that this is uh, a failure to hire somebody because of her gender or her sexual orientation. Um, and just for context, I mean, we've had the CID authority, I think, since, uh, I think the, the one case on the subject, there was an earlier version of the law, was uh, Jerome Diamond was the attorney general. Um, so it, it goes it goes way back. The, um, you want me to uh, show them. Just for context, in terms of like the complaints that come into us in the employment context and that we investigate, calls for assistance we probably receive between 800 and 1,200 a year. I, I don't have the current statistics on hand, but it's it's always near the thousands. And I would say at any given time, we have our open case in that investigator inventory is probably 90 to 120 cases of employment discrimination, and that ranges from family leave to uh, the right to, uh, to pump press milk at the workplace, to equal pay, to workers' compensation, retaliation, drug testing violations, and so forth. So we certainly um, do not investigate as many cases as people uh, ask us to, and the standard always is, you know, we assume if the, per the person we're gonna ask to provide information, if they said no, could we get a court order, and if not, uh, we might ask for voluntary compliance if they won't give it to us, and we wouldn't issue a CID. We would wait till we got more evidence. Senator Benning had a question, or do you still have a question? I do. Uh, if I had a nickel for every individual that I've seen pulled over on the roadside, and the police officer says, do you mind stepping out of the car? And what flows from that simple request, um, it, this concept of expanding the CID has me somewhat walking cautiously. There is a tendency to react in the heat of a given moment to creating legislation, but there's also, once legislation is created, a tendency on behalf of some to react in a given heated scenario to use these tools quite aggressively. And I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, I'm all in favor of a working group establishing parameters. All in favor of a system that is not resulting in disparate application throughout the state. I'm a little nervous when it comes to expanding this particular tool because now you're on the path of a criminal act, not a civil violation. And if you have a situation where somebody is obviously the target, um, and I could use names, but I probably shouldn't for the Bennington situation, but if there's somebody that's an obvious target, and they say, well, I'm not doing anything other than free speech, and you use that subpoena to go in, and they say, hey, check anything you want, and then all of a sudden you're looking at child porn on the computer, that's a whole other animal, and I, I'm, I want to walk through this very carefully. Thank you, briefly. In the consumer context, when our consumer protection uh, uh, unit is dealing with commercial practices, sometimes if they are asking, let's say there's an allegation of fraudulent, uh, it could be fraud in connection with any kind of commercial scheme, or it could be cramming on phone bills. Uh, sometimes when the party uh, Resists a, a CID. The alternative, sometimes the decision is they'll just they'll just sue them. They'll just file a lawsuit and issue a Rule 45 subpoena, uh, which has essentially the same provision. So, um, uh, the, the risk of uh, the abuse of legal process by 
uh, someone who's not willing to follow the rules or the, the letter of the spirit of the law exists in, in, in connection with any case where uh, anyone under state law has the ability to file a lawsuit. Um, so, I mean, sometimes, and that's, that's a question that is encountered whenever anyone is issuing a CID. Is it, would it be more efficient, better use of resources, just to file a lawsuit now? Um, the, the value of the CID um, that, that, that is provided where, um, that the lawsuit does not provide, where I identified a gap, is where you don't have a person to sue. So you're, you're making an effort to try to find the perpetrator. So in the news case, for example, trying to find who the perpetrator is and we have records that someone's willing to provide to us um, that might help us identify that person. So I mean, that's the notion. I, I totally understand that. And if the committee is not interested in, in conferring that power now, I, I would urge upon the committee to consider at least something in this bill that provides confidentiality for complaints that are brought to us under that statute. A concern that we, and, and uh, 9BSA 2460 has that confidentiality provision. So if we don't enjoy the confidentiality provision from 2460, um, then I think there should be some alternative. A concern that we would have is that as we increase it, and, and encourage reporting and communicating between agencies, uh, a concern we have is that potential targets or allies of people who we might be investigating would simply issue a public records request uh, to our office and then have the contents of our files, uh, which they might use either to avoid prosecution or um, harass or perhaps uh, you know, reach out to, to witnesses. Um, so I think confidentiality of that information is important. Uh, it's embedded within 2460, so if 2460 isn't there, um, something else should be. Well, yeah. okay. You know, the Bennington case has come up several times here. I'm obviously familiar with a lot of it, but I don't remember much more than one or two people involved, in, at least in the, in, in the Attorney General's investigation there. The numbers are relatively small, I believe. Uh, we're not sure about some, and would this allow us to find more? Well, in that case, based upon the speech activity, I mean, there was some activity, whether you or not you, you feel comfortable calling it speech, like the allegation about uh, swastikas on trees. Yeah. Uh, there was nobody identified with, in connection with that act. There was nobody you could subpoena, sue, or prosecute, or search, serve a search warrant on. But in the instances, I think, in the Attorney General's report where he refers to speech, the conclusion of the office was that that's constitutionally protected speech. So the Attorney General's office currently has civil hate crime authority, regardless of this bill. That, that has existed since 1999. Well, were there several? That's my point. I, 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 you would have to identify a crime um, or something that would set up, satisfy the statute, and we did not. I, I was going back to your um, reference to the fact that there was one person who was being investigated. He was accusing someone else of oh, having yeah. oh, okay. said, so there was, there was a back and forth in terms of accusations of bias. But in terms of the individuals, mm -hmm. as I read the investigation, there were allegations that certain things had happened. We don't know who the individuals were in all those cases. That's right. I mean, our office's charge in that case was to review the investigation that was already conducted. Some of the events that were identified, reports regarding people in the cemetery and the like, it happened several years earlier. Um, our charge wasn't uh, to start from the beginning and start canvassing the community at large to find out who was in the cemetery in 2016. That wasn't our charge. But, you know, in that case where we're talking about and there were allegations or claims, or certainly people were asking why we didn't charge people with crimes. Um, it was our conclusion in that case that, this, again, the evidence that we provided, that we reviewed, didn't meet, uh, you know, did not meet the, an underlying crime, and therefore we couldn't prosecute it civilly or criminally under either standard of proof because it seemed to us that it was within the realm of protected speech. Um, 
So there's a case where, at least in one instance, maybe two instances, we knew individuals, and we had the authority currently to just sue them under the law. And we chose not to do that because our assessment was that there was protected speech. It, it, as deeply as a, a offensive and, and abhorrent as it was, it was still um, within constitutional protection. You know, that's an important distinction that's been lost by many. Mm -hmm. That the conclusion of the Attorney General's office was that it was protected speech. And no matter how repugnant it was, that's the conclusion that was drawn. And I believe that, that um, there are some who are saying, well, why can't we make that a crime? Um, and, and, as I said earlier, uh, Mr. Chairman, some of the speech is so deeply offensive that it would meet the standard for this very difficult uh, legal claim of intentional inf infliction of emotional distress. And I mentioned there were two Supreme Court cases. One was against the Westboro Baptist Church regarding a protest at the funeral of the plaintiff's son uh, who had died in Iraq. Uh, that went to state court and resulted in multi-million dollar damages against the church that the Supreme Court subsequently reversed because the speech concerned, even though the father was a private citizen, the speech concerned matters of public concern, which had to do with America's involvement in the military and other public issues. Uh, and you know that was deeply hurtful, offensive speech, uh, and that uh, and the court pointed out that that particular group, the defendants in that case, had been using that tactic for 20 years, and yet the speech involved in that case was constitutional. In the, uh, we go to the weeds uh, in this committee. We're just frequently talking about getting into the weeds of the <laughs> different bills, and in this bill, um, a couple of witnesses have brought up the the working group and the membership of that group. Sure. <clears throat> and that there are, that there maybe there should be other groups and, or other persons or representatives from other groups involved in the working group. And the second was brought up by the ACLU about the Attorney General being the super member of the... Okay. Uh, actually, it was brought up by the, uh, not the ACLU, Rick the uh, Rick, Rick Gotham. Rick Gotham. Rick Gotham. Yeah. Let me blame the right people. I don't know if it's blameworthy. Um, with respect to the membership of the group, uh, I'm not the most knowledgeable person about the Criminal Justice Training Council. I know the, uh, the Attorney General's office has a representative on that. So that's Assistant Attorney General David Scher. Yep. Um, uh, I believe, the, and, and maybe others can speak to it, I believe the Criminal Justice Training Council has a public participation component to it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what the details of that are. I, knew, I know, for example, with respect to the fair and impartial policing uh, policy that was working through the council, members of the, uh, of the VCJTC, uh, one of whom is, uh, is still here, I think, behind me, uh, spent many days um, discussing that with Migrant Justice and the ACLU. So I'm not sure what's formally in the process for that. Uh, with respect to the AG's office having approval of that, uh, of the training, um, I don't know that I have, I have an opinion be, uh, on the subject. I think the distinction between the fair and impartial policing law where the Attorney General has to certify compliance. Of the, of the policies for the agencies. For the agencies. So Vermont yeah. has 70 to 80 yeah. agencies and the role of the AG mm -hmm. in that statute is not to evaluate the training council, it just has one vote on the council, but to evaluate the, the policies that are out in the public in the right. agencies to, for compliance. Yeah. So I think that's a distinction. Very different. But I, I don't think, uh, you, know, I, you know, this is above my pay period, but I don't, I don't think our office has a real concern about whether we, uh, you know, are a super member or not. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been teaching the hate crimes class at the police academy uh, since 2009, I think this April, it's going to be my 19th or 20th class. Um, I don't know what the existing law is. I think it, it's that the Attorney General um, <coughs> approves or supervises the training or something like that. But frankly, we, do, we write the PowerPoints and we deliver it. We provide it to the council and get feedback. So I think that system's working well. And we have, I don't think we, have, they would, we need to have any special. Are there other questions before we? Release the witness. 
Thank you for having me in there. Bryn, could you, um, and you're welcome to stay right in your chair. Um, yeah. Okay. There, were, there were a couple of suggestions from um, Amy um, Jonas. I forget her title. Major. Major. Major, sorry. With regard to um, standard and what that means, Bryn heard those. And there was yeah. a suggestion that Bryn and Julio. I think the first question for, yeah. for us is do we want to mark up the draft and then introduce a bill after we've marked it up, or do we want to introduce the draft and then mark up a bill? Because of the unique situation here, we could we could have a bill that pretty much has been developed by us and actually could be looked at by, say, the Government Operations Committee. Do you want my opinion? Yeah. Okay. I think we should, the suggestions that have come so far have been um, pretty uh, structural kinds of suggestions, and I think that we should just put them into the draft so that when people comment on it, they're commenting on where if, if we decide to go there they're commenting on where we've already decided to go instead of having to repeat all those suggestions that's my opinion so we will and i unfortunately senator benning and i didn't hear all the testimony but i do have a couple of points you wanted to yeah bryn heard it yeah i did and so i, I think i have a good idea of um the suggestions that were made by all the witnesses i think what I can do, and what I've already started to do, is put together a draft incorporating um, the suggestions that I thought received, um, that were well received by the committee. Um, and what I can do is sort of um, put in some sort of indication about who suggested who what, um, and in that way I can circulate it to you all and you can decide which changes you'd like to make and which you would not. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And I think there was some suggestion yeah. to have <coughs> around the, the wording of defining it to have um, Ingrid and Elizabeth work with you around the language. And for feel like with regard to the, the splitting that up, the bias and the bias the into the, yeah. yeah, have that a different date. Have I'm a, sure you have that at a different effective date. Different effective date. Yeah, you, you got it all. Yes, I wasn't sure if that is what the committee wants to do, is to do a different effective date, or if you wanted to just take out the bias. On the well, and yeah. I, I would like to do both. <coughs> I would like to make the effective date six months later. I, you mean the effective date for the training? Yes. Yeah, I would like to take out bias training, bias incident training, out of that section altogether and put it in one of the duties of the working group to come up with what is bias incident training and what are the parameters? Well, I, I guess my reason thinking. for suggesting I see the law enforcement representatives, representatives all agreeing with Senator White. But. No, I, I would see that they, that they would. Um, in, in other words, I think if we're going to do this, we should, we should be requiring that bias incident uh, go into the training. If we take it out of the bill, we're leaving it to the whims of... No, of, yeah. I'm not taking it out of the bill. I thought that's what you just no, said. No, I said, okay, just remove this section. from the section where it says this training has to be done in four hours because we don't know what bias incident is yet and put it in the working group to define what and come yeah. back with a recommendation for what the, would be right, that but then, training. But then there's not a requirement that there be yeah. Oh, yeah, I think we can say that there's a requirement yeah, I mean, you, for you the training. I want to say there's a requirement, yeah. but I want to but go back to, to my, it. my early question of, yeah. of, I think it was Julio uh, or TJ. If somebody calls another person and does, um, is that something that... And that goes to what Senator White was talking about in terms of defining it. And I think that has to be done. I'm, I'm just saying that um, right now, I think the, the bill is um, well structured in that it includes, in addition to the training program, my suggestion is that we put that out a year past the rest of the bill so that there's time not only for the working group to finish, but to add it to the training. And, and I think the other question that we could get testimony on further is should there be more members of the working group? Yes. Yes. For now, I'm just adding the sheriff. Yeah, those yes. two. 
So if you're Plus doing a draft here, you could put the the Philip recommendation or the White recommendation, and we can I'm, talk I'm about. I'm not convinced they, they're that different. You no, know, well, I think they are that different okay. because this, the way this is worded, it says you have to do bias incident training, and it says how much. It says. Um, uh, a four hour, minimum of four hours of her training, and what Rick talked about was not necessarily defining the, the number of hours, but talking about outcomes that you're trying to achieve from the training. And, okay. and so they may come in and say, we need this type of training around bias incidents because it's so complicated that we need this kind of training. And so it should be done um, every other day, or it should be 72 hours, or it should be, but by putting it in there with the other training that we're required, we're already defining what the training is. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just hoping that the draft will require training. Yeah. Then we can talk about when it goes into effect, but if, if what you're suggesting is that we instead have the working group to investigate whether we need No, no, that isn't what I said. Okay, that's what I heard no. you say. That they are defining what bias incident means, and then they're going to recommend the kind of training that has to happen around bias incidents. But it is a requirement. Yeah, it's going to be required training. But they have to define it first and then come in with recommendations. So that's all. I, get a, I, I would ask you to okay. continue this conversation. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for being here and their help in the. In, well, it's an informal process. It's, uh, Thanks.